Hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, it's the first Monday of the month, which means that we have none other than Dr. John McDougall, who is going to be giving a brand new lecture today on my favorite subject, which is obesity. Now, before he gives his lecture, we always like to start Dr. McDougall's talk with a testimonial for somebody that was helped by his work. If you watched last month, we had Plantiful Kiki on who talked about how she read the starch solution and then lost 70 pounds and reversed all her diseases. Well, today we have a young lady who in her 70s lost over 150 pounds simply from reading this book. This is the best book ever written on diet. I'm telling you, it's been a bestseller for probably over 30 years. Everything you need to know about weight loss is in this book. And she's here today to talk about it. You might know her from my show before. She's an amazing story, an amazing person. Please welcome Esther Loveridge. I bet you never get tired of telling this story. Oh, no, I don't. But this is really special to get to be here today to thank Dr. McDougall for not only saving my life, for, for rejuvenating it. You know, it's one thing to still be alive, but then it's wonderful to be healthy and alive. And what I really want to say to you, Dr. McDougall, is that you had the best parents. You had parents that you taught you to tell the truth. And I want to testify, first of all, to your character. And then you also honor all of those special people that came on before you, and you always pay tribute to them as well as part of your success. And finally, you give so freely. You know, all of your website is free. You've downloaded books free for people. And uh, there is a lot of power in the book. And actually, the book that saved my life was a little bit different version from what Chef A just showed, but is this one, the McDougal program. Wait a minute. I am so sorry. I pulled the wrong book. That is yes, the book I yes. meant to show. <laughs> so we have to show the right one. Because this is the book, if I open it inside, there is his autograph. Isn't that wonderful? And that was from September 8th of 2018. And that was just two years after I began following this program. And I didn't have the privilege of getting to go to his in-class program right away. But it, it, it's just amazing what you can learn just from the book itself. But two years later, I did want to pay him back because he had saved my life. And so in uh, September of 2018, I took three other people with me and we did attend his three day uh, course in Santa Rosa, which was wonderful. And then the next year, oh, and then I also did the starch solution that year because I wanted to learn all I could and how else could I pay back to him? Because before that I was buying his books online and buying used ones to pass out and he wasn't benefiting from that. So I wanted to pay back. So we did go to his course and it's fabulous. And now he has the 10-day course, which is even better. People from all over the world can come and attend and benefit from that. But basically, I'm just so thrilled to tell you that I'm wearing the outfit that I wore back when I was really, I don't know where to show this picture. Will that show up there, Chef AJ? Yeah, wow. Anyway, you can see that I'm wearing the same outfit today. So I'm going to stand up and try and do a little strip tease. But don't get worried, it's gonna be decent. So as I back up, you can see this outfit is just so big on me, you know, just really big. So I'll take off the jacket and then I've got this big size three X. Can you believe that? And then I've got to take that off. <laughs> and now we have the shirt, the starts, I mean, the um, it's the food. And I'll take off my pants and let them drop. But look how big. I mean, they're, I don't, they're just huge. So now those are gonna come off. So all you have to do people is just follow his book, attend his classes, uh, get on his webinar and just learn all you can. And he's gonna teach you all you need to know about obesity. But I wanna read one thing from Disease Reversal Hope. It's a new book by Dr. Stoll because in it, he lists all my diseases. And my conditions were obesity, depression, GERD, diverticulitis, bipolar, prediabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, gastritis, pancreatitis, anemia, insomnia, vision problems, gallbladder disease, hyperlipidemia, constipation, 
hypothyroidism and knee problems. And I didn't think I was sick. Can you believe that? But I lost 130 pounds after following the McDougal program for maximum weight loss and a total of 155 altogether. But I like to claim what I lost under his program. So if you have any more questions, I just want to say thank you, Dr. McDougal. Thank you for saving our planet. Thank you for saving us people. Thank you for continuing to teach every day. All, I mean, you just are amazing, you and Mary. And I just can't pay tribute enough to you for saving my life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esther. I just want people to hear how much you suffered oh. during that 130 pound weight loss. I mean, it must've been excruciatingly painful. It was pure joy. It was pure joy. And, I, and I, as long as I have a minute, I also want to thank you for writing the foreword to my book because the timeline was, I started in July 16. That was just five and a half years ago. And then I did the start solution. Then I attended your three day program. And then in 2020, you wrote the foreword to my book. And then because I still want to pay back to you, all of the royalties that I get from my book go to your foundation. And I'm so thrilled that you accept that. And I can donate that way. And then Dr. Scott Stoll found my story on your um, uh, Star McDougaller and found me that way and contacted me and wanted to use my story and give you all the credit well, that's for just what saved my life in, in their new book about re reversing all these diseases. Well, it's uh, certainly it's going to take a big army to change the world, isn't it? But we're, we're doing it. Yeah. We're doing it. No, I, I, you know, I, I really, what I, I hope people got your comeback correctly is that you didn't suffer at all losing. Oh, no, 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 no. Prior, prior to that, I mean, you must have suffered through starvation programs, make yourself <laughs> sick programs, uh -oh. you know, feeling guilty programs, you know, maybe even, I don't know, wearing a corset or something to squeeze. Yeah. Your skin, right? Yeah. The, what people go through. Yes. They, they, they want to look good. We, we want to look, we want to be attractive to other people. And uh, that, of course, means looking healthy because you're attracted yeah. to good health. That's what you're. Anyway, so I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you've done so well. I have, as anybody who hears you talk with your enthusiasm, I have no doubt you have permanently changed your life. Oh. Why would you look back? Why would you look any place? No. <laughs> Not at all. Well, I, I will say that I did try one other diet before you, and it was the Atkins diet, and I almost died with gallbladder disease and pancreatitis at the same time yes so it's well, yeah. everything's gone when i go to kaiser now and they pull up my chronic conditions yeah. the page is blank there is nothing there that's where i'll be the, the kaiser ought to be collecting your premiums and not putting anything out that to me would be a good business a good insurance company that collected the premiums and yes didn't put anything out <clears throat> Oh, well, you look wonderful. It's great to have this opportunity just to- Well, thank you, Esther. Time. Well, I'll spread the good news. I mean, there's nothing like example. Oh. And, you know, I, I hope what people heard is just what a happier person Esther is and how much easier life is for her now that she hasn't carried 130 pounds extra and all the guilt that goes along with it. You know, it's just yeah. it's terrible. In the well, shape. So let's, let's, like I keep saying every day, we have a world to save. Let's get out there and do it. Yes. Well, there's already, the, and, and then I, in the interim between reading your book and now, I did start that group on Facebook, Esther's Nutritional Journey, and now there's 12.7 thousand people there. So we are spreading the word, and everyone whose live view is touched, we are all replicating your DNA to the world. Well, for, for a lot of people, it's not easy being confronted with learning a new way to eat and but once you learn it, I mean, it's just like everything else you've done in life, you say to yourself, well, why didn't I do this before? It's so easy. Yeah. Such an easy, simple, enjoyable, yeah. cost-free way of living. Why didn't yeah. I? Well, I'm going to try and explain why people don't do it in terms of their weight. And they obviously don't because good grief, we sure have a marketplace out there, Esther. We've got somewhere around 80% of the U.S. population, whether well, 330 million people in the United States and then we got the world and probably three and a half billion people in the world are overweight. Oh, we got a lot of work to do. We're going to have to stay healthy. I know. We're going to have to leave, live to be 105, which is beyond my prediction. It's, it's the food, people. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Oh, and it saved my husband's life, too. 
Well, that, I, I hope that was an advantage, you know. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. Hope, I hope you like him. <laughs> oh, I do. I do. And oh, his job funny. is to take care of me. So now he's healthy, too. He yeah. went, he used, to, he used to weigh 320. He got down to 220. That was as low as he could go. Then he finally joined me on, the, on following your program. And he's down to 160 on a six foot frame. Wow. And he's got, it went from a 52 inch belt to a 32 inch belt. So I'm very proud of him. It's infectious. It is. It is. Why not? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you've done a lot of good work. And I know I know it feels good to you, Esther, just like it feels oh. good to me. I mean, you yes. never get tired of hearing that you've helped. No, them. no, it's good. Well, our love to Mary and you both. Have Thank a you. wonderful Thank day. Well, we're going to do that. We're going to start talking about a AJ's favorite subject. Anytime you're ready, AJ. Yeah, let's go, Dr. McDougall. I, and I'm so sorry I pulled the wrong book off my bookshelf, but I got to say, you were quite the looker back in the day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about now, AJ? Come on now. <laughs> well, you look great now, too, but I mean, what? A, we, we were really, really quite handsome. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I think Mary married me for my personality, though. <laughs> <laughs> She just said, uh, she said she, I think she said, I never want to be bored my whole life. So I'm going to stick my wagon to you. And I, she's not been bored. Anyway, um, thank you. So what I'd like, to, I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you as if you were my patient. I want to talk to you about uh, your body fat. Now, and I know uh, there are a lot of people out there who this isn't appropriate for because you're really happy with what you weigh and, you know, the way you look and that's fine. But a lot of people aren't happy about the way they look, certainly the way they feel, their health, and they like to they like to have things different. And when I say a lot of people, what I'm talking about is you know 80% of the population is either overweight or obese. Now, I titled this lecture uh, "Why Am I So Fat?" And the initial reaction that I got was, "You can't say fat; it's politically incorrect." So I went and looked up the other words for, the, for fat. I mean, would you rather say I am portly, I am rotund, I am pudgy, uh, I'm well padded, you know, I'm well rounded, I'm brought in the beam. What would you like to call yourself? I, I can't find any pleasant terms associated with being overweight. I don't know, maybe somebody thinks something complimentary or nice, but when I looked at uh, various, uh, very similar words. I didn't find anything that I'd like to be called. So let's just assume, let's just assume that a good share of the population doesn't want to be the weight that they are. They realize it's a health problem. In addition to it being a problem in their sex life, their, their work life, everything affects them and they want to be different. How many people are we talking about? Well, we're talking about two thirds of the population of Western countries. We're talking about a third of the people being obese. The estimates are in some parts of the United States, that soon two thirds of the people will be obese, not just overweight, but obese. And that would be in the Southeast United States that predict these kinds of changes. So it's a growing epidemic, pardon the pun. What, why, why are you so fat? Why am I so fat? And, and by the way, just as a disclaimer, I just want you to know that my top weight was 90 pounds heavier than I am now. So, you know, I've kind of been there. Uh, why am I so fat? Well. <laughs> My, my stomach was, was, was built too big for my body, or, or it wasn't built too big, but through years of gorging, I've stretched it out. And now it's too big for my body. I'm to blame. There's something wrong with me. Or, or I'm an obsessive compulsive overeater. All I can think about is food. There, there's something wrong with my mental emotional makeup. I need to see a psychiatrist. I have an eating disorder. I'm to blame. There's something wrong with me. Or how about bad genes? You know, this has been an excuse given uh, for as long as I've been in the medical business. And that is that it says a genetic tendency. Well, you know what? Two thirds of the population has a genetic tendency, I would say, because two thirds of the population is overweight or obese. So it must be a pretty plentiful gene to say the least. And of course, a lot of this has come out of laboratories where they have, uh, they've caused various animals, particularly mice and rats, to, to, uh, to develop a gene that they call a thrifty gene, where they easily gain excess weight. So how come, how come there's a problem with the human design? It doesn't seem to be with any other animal. 
There's no. no animal living naturally that's too fat. But somehow our creator, when he or she got around to making the human being, maybe they were tired out or they're just frustrated. I don't know. And somehow the human being was designed flawed. I doubt it. I mean, you have to agree with me that, you know, nature is perfect. Uh, put things together correctly. And the human being is one, one, of the, one of the better designs. Certainly, I wouldn't say it's the best design out there as far as an animal is concerned. But we must, just like every other animal, we must have a diet that's ideal for us. And if we're not following that diet, then the problem's not with me. The problem's with what we know. If we feed our animals other than their natural diet, we know what the consequence is. You feed your, your dog or your cat table scraps and what happens? This is animal abuse. If we fed our animals these kinds of foods, we might get arrested by the Humane Society. We, we'd be accused by, by our friends and relatives of committing animal abuse, of causing our animals to be sick and portly. But somehow or another, we can do this to our family. We can put all that junk food in there. It's socially acceptable. You get no prison time, but it is, it is abuse, ladies and gentlemen. The, the, the people out there who, who suffer from being overweight and the associated complications, they're in real pain. You know, their life isn't going the way it could or should. So this is something that uh, needs to be correct. If it's genetics or your stomach is stretched out too big for your body or you, you have a mental or emotional disorder, maybe I can't solve it here. But if it's something else, maybe I can help you solve it. The something else is this, we're feeding our families, our communities, well, now the whole world, a meal plan that was never known to human beings. And it's a meal plan that I know we ask for it. You know, we ask for these high calorie, high fat, relatively inexpensive meals, as many calories we can get in for a dollar. And industry has responded by over the top entrees, like 1,360 calories when they stuff cheese into your pancakes or 1,150 calories when you get yourself a, a burrito, a taco meal from Taco Bell. And if you have four slices of pizza, and believe me, I used to have four slices of pizzas, ladies and gentlemen, I would guess you do too. That's 1,240 calories, high fat, high saturated fat. And the newest uh, rendition from McDonald's is the land, sea, and air burger. It's a combination. You got it. Something from the sea, like a fish. Something from the air, like a bird. Something from the land, like a cow. They put it all together for you. 1,330 calories, 69 grams of fat. Half of, the, half of the calories come from fat. So with this kind of meal plan, we end up eating a diet that once condemned just a few people to obesity and sickness. And these were the rich people of the past. You can go back 5,000 years. You can see that when the pharaohs and the priests and the priestess, they ate the rich foods, they became overweight. They developed uh, atherosclerosis in their arteries. Uh, they had uh, malformations in their children related to eating the Western diet. These diseases have gone on forever. The difference is, is that then there were just a few aristocrats, a few kings and queens. These days, at least over the last 50 years, maybe 100 years, maybe 150 years, these days what we have is we have a population on this planet where approximately half the people can eat like kings and queens because of uh, fossil fuels, because of the industrial revolution. We've, we've made a situation where we can transport food so efficiently, we can grow it so efficiently that we can get everybody to eat like a king and a queen. And what would you expect them to look like? I mean, look around you. you, you if you were putting on a, a play for King Henry VIII, you'd have no trouble casting it, would you? Your friends and relatives. And we don't even joke about it. We even name some of our products after royalty like Imperial Margin or Dairy Queen or Burger King. We don't even try and hide it. And again, you know, I started out this conversation. You may be very pleased with your personal appearance. And if uh, that's the way you feel about it, certainly... Uh, I know a lot of people do, but a lot of people are very uncomfortable and they like a solution. So uh, 
when you eat too many calories, you like to eat all these rich foods that I just showed you, or you feed your dog and cat too many calories or whatever, uh, you, you have to rebalance the situation if you're going to lose weight. It's calories in versus calories out. It's the law of thermodynamics. You can't beat it. And I see three options to rebalance the situation when you overstuff too much rich food. You can starve, in other words, portion control, in other words, diet, or you can make yourself sick, which are the low carb keto, Atkins type diets, or you can eat a starch-based diet, which is the diet for people. That's your three choices. I can think of another, not other. Uh, the first choice, portion control while in pain, because you're always in pain. You know, you can live to be 95 years old and it's never gonna feel good to be hungry. It's a drive that's there to keep you alive. It, it forces you to take in calories so you survive, you can't beat it, but you try. You try by saying to yourself, I have willpower. You know, I can stand the pain, the suffering, you can, but just for a short period of time and then you give up, you go back and eat. You get hungry, so hungry, you say, I, I'd eat the pain off the refrigerator. And then, and then you ask for help dealing with this pain, help with starvation, help with portion control. And of course, we have surgeons out there that will rearrange your intestinal tract and cause you to develop malabsorption as a consequence of their surgery intervention. And we have drug companies that have tried to give you pills that somehow diminish your hunger drive, but they've been a consistent failure over the years. Too little weight loss, too toxic. This has not been a good option for people. And so out of desperation, what folks have been doing, and they do it over, over a cycle of, of years. And they used to do it in the 70s. And now it's very popular in the, in the uh, you know, these new times. In fact, the 1990s to 2000, the low carb keto diets became very popular. I don't see them waning much these days. But that's your other choices. You can go on a keto diet. A keto diet, what does keto refer to? It refers to ketosis. Ketosis is a state that develops naturally when you are starving to death or suffering severe prolonged illness. When you're starving, you don't want to suffer the pain of hunger so that you can't think about getting yourself out of trouble. So after about two or three days, you go into a state of ketosis which suppresses the appetite. Likewise, when you're sick, you're not supposed to be gathering and preparing food. You're supposed to be recuperating. So you go into a state of ketosis. Well, if you take enough sugar, carbohydrate out of your diet, you will go into a state of sickness, a state of starvation, which are the keto Atkins type diets, the low carb diets. And how long can you stay sick? Well, you know, a lot of people say not very long. In fact, a lot of people will tell me that's the worst choice they ever made as far as a, a dietary change. But, but I know they were thrilled initially because when you go on these keto diets, what happens is you burn up your carbohydrate reserves, which are the glycogen molecules that are in your liver and in your muscles. And you carry around about two pounds of glycogen invisibly in your liver and muscles. And when you stop eating sugar, you know, glycogen is sugar, then what happens is you utilize the glycogen stores because that's the preferential food of the body. It's the fuel of the body, is sugar, glycolysis, glycogen. You know, it all comes to go, to go together. And so you take and you mobilize that two pounds that are in your liver and muscles of glycogen, along with that two pounds comes four pounds of water so you lose a total of six pounds in the first four, five, six, seven days. You go, Nirvana, I finally discovered the diet I've been looking for forever. And then, of course, you go into ketosis. You lose your appetite. You're sick. And you can keep it up for a while. But there are so many complications related to your health, including increased risk of dying, increased risk of dying of heart disease, kidney stones, all kinds of problems. Too big a price to pay. So you can be in pain or you can make yourself sick. Or the third option, there has to be a diet for human beings, don't you think? You know, all the other animals, the hippopotamuses, the alligators, the piranhas, you know, even all the insects, they have a diet that's ideal for them, that makes them look, feel, and function their best. Don't you think there ought to be such a diet for us, for people? Obviously, we haven't discovered that diet, at least as far as the, the world picture goes. 
you know, 80% of the people in developed countries are either obese or overweight and, and they're sick with cancer and heart disease and diabetes and constipation. We haven't figured out that diet, I don't think. Hopefully you'll find that what I have to tell you over the next few minutes that will convince you that we do know the diet for human beings. Even though we malign it, we ignore it. We know what people are supposed to eat. Now, if you don't believe me, when I get done with this lecture, then I encourage you to do is go find some guru you do believe. Ask whoever you want to lead you in the direction of better health. What do you believe is the best diet for human beings? I'm gonna tell you what I believe is the best diet for human beings. In fact, we offer this diet, we offer it on our website, uh, drmcdougall.com as a free program. You don't have to pay for anything. You know, instructions on how to get ready for the program, on laboratory tests that you should get, on relationships you should have with your medical doctor, on how to, how to shop, or how to put together meals, and a whole bunch of recipes are there and available for you free, no gimmicks. And the food's really delicious. Uh, we have over five, 4,000 recipes that uh, Mary has published over the years. And we have a thousand of them on the McDougal mobile, mobile cookbook app. And we probably have about six, 800 of them on the website for free. And in the various books, and you know, I've offered you many of these books for free. There are also lots and lots of recipes. So you're not gonna run into a problem with with finding a lot of recipes. In fact, uh, you need to just find a few things that you enjoy and repeat them over and over again. There are three qualities of a people's food that I need to discuss with you right now. And it's very important you understand these qualities. It'll explain to you why other diets don't work, why this is the answer for you and why the human being was built for the kind of diet that I share with you the McDougal diet, which is, I'm gonna mention it for the first time, a starch-based diet. So let's take a look at some qualities of this diet that cause you to look good, feel good, and function well, and to lose excess weight. The, the first thing is, is this is a, what I call a calorie dilute diet. Okay, in other words, for a certain volume, there are fewer calories than would be in a calorie-dense diet. So if we start over here on the left-hand side, we are starting with butter, oil, salad dressing, corn oil, any kinds of pure fats or oils there, nine calorie per gram. Very, cal the most dense of all calorie foods. Uh, cheese, about four calories per gram. Meat, about four calories per gram. Starches, like corn and rice, one calorie per gram and potatoes are a six tenths of a calorie per gram. So what you wanna do is you wanna fill this hollow organ. No, it wasn't designed too big for your body. No, you didn't stretch it out, but you need to fill it up with foods that provide a lot of bulk with just the right amount of calories. Now you have to, you know, just supplying it with bulk is not gonna work for you. You know, many of you I'm sure have tried fiber pills which don't have any calories that provide the bulk in the stomach and you, you never get satisfied as far as your hunger drive is concerned. And the satisfaction you feel is only fleeting. You have to have further things happen. And that is that these calories that you do consume have to, have to contain the right kind of fuel. And uh, that fuel, which is sugar, it's glucose, the process is called glycolysis that sugar reaches the brain and lets the brain know that you've eaten it and you get satisfaction of your hunger drive. It's much more complex than I just explained to you, but generally that's what happens is we eat, we eat foods that are not too calorie dense and we eat foods that contain the right fuel for the human body so we get satisfaction. So the first principle is filling up the stomach, which you can see is done with uh, a lot more volume, a lot fewer calories if you pick things like rice, corn and potatoes as opposed to butter, cheese and meat. Now, a lot of people get confused. They say, look, I, I, I have looked up the calorie concentration of carbohydrate and you say potatoes are only one calorie per gram or six tenths of a calorie per gram. But what it says is it says carbohydrate is four calories per gram. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason you got confused is because what they're talking about is pure white sugar. Pure white sugar, table sugar is four calories per gram. 
to turn that into a potato, you have to add water and fiber and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it dilutes it down to less than one calorie per gram. I hope this confusion has been cleared up. Uh, principle two, losing excess body fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. If you take a look at uh, the left-hand side, the same foods that were calorie dense are also high in fat. For example, butter's 100% fat, cheese 70% fat, your meat 60% fat, whereas your rice is five, your corn is eight, and your potatoes are 1% fat. The body is going to do the most efficient thing possible with everything that you put into it. And the most efficient thing to do with the fat is to store it. The most efficient thing to do with the carbohydrate is to burn it. That's what the body prefers to use for its, for its daily fuel. And there are some cells in the body that only will burn sugar. They won't burn fat or protein, like your red blood cells or certain cells in the kidney or your brain prefers burning sugar. Under desperation, it will burn fat. So you see that uh, the same foods that are calorie dense are also high in fat and the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And by the way, each of the stomachs you're looking at contains 500 calories of food to put it in perspective. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Somehow or another, people don't understand this is that the most efficient thing with the body to do with the fat that you eat is just to move it from your fork and spoon to your thighs, your abdomen, your buttocks, the fat you eat is the fat you wear from my lips to my hips. And the scientific evidence is absolutely clear and consistent with something that's so logical. And that is that the body is going to store fat as the metabolic dollar for when no food is available. And the easiest way to do that is to take fat that you eat and put it in your body fat. And it does it so efficiently that it doesn't even change the chemical structure of the fats. So in other words, if you eat, um, Crisco's and margarines. Your, your body fat, if I were to biopsy it, your liver or your, or your buttocks, abdomen, thighs, I was I'd take a needle and stick it in there and suck the fat out and take it to the lab and analyze it. I, I would find that your body fat is full of trans fats. If you happen to partake in fish oils, you know, the omega-3 fats, when I biopsied your body fat, it would be full of omega-3 fats. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. It doesn't even change the chemical structure when it moves it to your fatty tissues. Now I've listed for you multiple studies that show this. Here's the studies, you can look them up. And you'll see each and every examination shows that the fats on your body come from the fats you eat. And there are people out here that tell you that you need a high fat diet, especially good fats is going to solve your problems of health and weight. You know, there's nothing more attractive about wearing good fats as opposed to bad fats. They're all, they're all detracting, all bulging, all inconvenient. And in one way or another, they all contribute to bad health. So <clears throat> what happens to the, uh, to the excess calories that you say consume in, uh, in potatoes or rice or corn? You're told don't eat rice, don't eat rice, it turns to sugar, which turns to fat. Aren't you told that don't eat rice, turn, don't eat potatoes, turns to sugar, turns to fat. That does not happen. The process called de novo lipogenesis, in other words, the conversion of sugar to fat is insignificant in the human being. It's too inefficient for the body to do it. Now cows and pigs, they're quite good at turning carbohydrate, sugar into fat, but not, not people. Uh, let me give you an example of a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. What they did is they took trim and obese women and they gave them 50% more calories than they usually ate, which amounted to three and a half ounces of refined sugar every day. 50% more calories and three and a half ounces of refined sugar they ate every day. And they did this for a period of uh, nearly four months. And it took four months to gain one pound of body fat. And the conclusion of this article, just like every other article published on this subject is that the conversion of sugar into body fat does not contribute greatly to fat balance. 
well, you, you've got to discount this whole kind of thinking that somehow eating rice or potatoes turns to sugar and makes you fat. And you can start by discounting the fact that your observations of the world prove otherwise. Are rice eaters thin or overweight? Are potato eaters thin or overweight? All right, that's going to be a little bit more complex, but I want to go over the, all the mechanisms for you. If you'll just bear with me a minute, uh, what happens is when you eat starch, okay, this is, this is the way sugar is presented to you in the form of rice and bread and pasta and corn and potatoes. You start on the left-hand corner, left-hand bottom corner. Uh, you consume starch. Uh, the intestinal tract breaks down the, the chains of sugars into individual sugars like glucose. The conversion of glucose into body fat, I told you, is very inefficient. It costs 30% of the calories to do this. And that's why the body doesn't do it because the body is uh, the ultimate inefficiency. So because it's so costly, you don't get this kind of conversion as I explained to you just a minute ago. However, it hardly costs any calories to move the fat to your body fat. It only costs 3% of the calories. Now what happens, say, say you need 2000 calories a day to run the machinery. What happens if you take in an extra thousand calories of sugar? What, what happens to it? It's too inefficient for the body to convert it into body fat. I just showed you in four months, it take, took four months to gain a pound with that kind of overfeeding. So what, what does the body do with these extra calories? Well, what the body does is it burns them off as heat through respiration, through body perspiration, all through, through uh, non-athletic movements such as uh, jittering. Uh, they're just kind of subclinical or sub observation movements. The body kind of increases the metabolism, just burns it off as heat. So next time somebody says, don't eat rice, turns to sugar, makes you fat. Well, you start by correcting them, tell them this doesn't happen in human beings to any significant amount. All right, principle number three is satisfying the hunger drive. And you do this with carbohydrate. We know that carbohydrate is what the hunger drive responds to in terms of satisfaction. In experiments, if you take, for example, and you feed people fat, they, they don't even notice it. it. They consume it without even having any regulatory mechanism for this fat, much less noticing any satiety. When you feed them carbohydrate, sugar, what happens is you notice when you ask your participants, they tell you that they're tremendously satisfied. Well, let's take a look at the carbohydrate content of uh, these same three stomachs that contain 500 calories per stomach. You find that butter, oil, vegetable oil, your best oily salad dressing is all fat. It has no carbohydrate. It has no sugar to satisfy the hunger drive. Uh, cheese, 2% of the calories are carbohydrate to satisfy the hunger drive, almost zero. Meat, same thing, almost zero carbohydrate calories for satisfying the hunger drive. But look how much satisfaction you get out of your rice and corn and potatoes, loaded with appetites, satisfying carbohydrate. Now, let me tell you why this is important to you or maybe important to you. It's because you don't understand why you can't get control of your hunger drive. You just cannot get in control. You think there's something wrong with you. You think that you're an obsessive compulsive overeater or you've got an eating disorder. And the reason is this. You sit down to a plate of carbohydrate deficient foods like butter and cheese and meat, poultry and fish. You sit down to a plate oil of these carbohydrate deficient foods and you chew and swallow and you get no central satisfaction. You, you stay just, just as hungry and you know you get up and get a second plate of food and still you're ravenously hungry and finally you get the signals that it's time to stop eating. You're overstuffed and in pain. I remember these times when I used to eat this kind of meal plan. If I could have found room for one more pork chop, I'd have shoved it in. So you walk by, you walk by the candy machine, you say to yourself, oh, I'm still starving to death. I, 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 it's almost like I didn't eat. I must be mentally ill. You know, you know, you may have a lot of emotional and mental problems. I'm not denying that. But your relationship to food is not one of them. The reason that you are still hungry is because you did not eat what satisfies the hunger drive, which is carbohydrate, sugar. 
All right, you have uh, certain drives that uh, are necessary to keep us alive. Let me just play a little game with you for a minute. First of all, there are, we have many drives that we don't have to satisfy to keep us alive. For example, the drive for money, the drive for position at your workplace, the drive for sex. You don't have to satisfy these to stay alive. Yet we kill for these th drives. There, there are only three drives that keep us alive and they are breath, thirst, and hunger. And I ask you, what satisfies breath? And you say air. No, no, it's not air. You could take a mixture of gases and you could leave out what does satisfy the breathing drive, which is oxygen. You'd be huffing and puffing and dead in three minutes. It's not air, it's not any mixture of gases, it's oxygen that satisfies the hunger drive. And I ask you what satisfies thirst and you say beer, <laughs> orange juice. Excuse me, it's only water that satisfies the hunger drive. The only other liquid I can think of that people might drink would be pure alcohol. And I, I can't imagine any thirst satisfaction from drinking pure alcohol. It's water that satisfies the thirst drive. And when I say what satisfies hunger, if you come back to me, you say food, I say wrong. It's carbohydrate, it's sugar that satisfies the hunger drive. Uh, the beginning of this satisfaction is the tongue. Uh, the tongue tastes with pleasure two substances and that's sweetness and saltiness. That's because we're designed as seekers of salt and sugar. We need these things to, to stay healthy. You have to get the minerals associated with salt and you have to get your primary source of energy, which is sugar. Now, the other two taste buds that we knew about up until recently were bitter and sour, which, which are taste buds that cause you to not be poisoned. Bitter and sour things in nature are at best medicines, at worst poisons. So we have these two taste buds to protect us from poisoning ourselves when we go out and select in nature. The uh, next taste bud to be discovered was umami. And this is uh, one that is sensitive to MSG. Now meat eaters will tell you that's the one that tells you you're supposed to be a meat eater. It's not, it's, it's a sensitivity to monosodium glutamate. The, the next, next uh, taste bud to be discovered was one of re repulsion. And that was the fat tasting taste, but if you can taste fat, you're repulsed by it. And so it's a taste bud that protects you and keeps you away from fat. And, and the last taste bud to discover was discovered about eight years ago. Uh, it was at or Oregon State University. What they did is they blocked the sweet tasting taste buds with, with the chemical that they gave to their subjects. And then they, they gave them starchy foods, breads and pastas and potatoes, et cetera. And what they found was an independent, powerful, starch sensitive taste bud. They found taste buds for starch that were just as strong as those for sugar, proving that we are a starch eater. You know, I thought about going through a whole discussion with you about how the anatomy and physiology of the human being is built to be a plant eater, a starch eater. And I was gonna tell you about the hands that we have for, for, for grasping, for, for picking up potatoes and bananas, et cetera. Not, not for tearing apart meat. I was going to, and this picture is appropriate here, I was gonna to talk to you about the teeth. You know, people say that we're, uh, we're omnivores because of these canine teeth. Excuse me, where are the canine teeth? I don't, I don't see any canine teeth. You see canine teeth in a cat. I see no teeth in our mouth that are uh, similar to our cat. If you were going to explore the cat's tongue, you would find no taste buds for sugar, for starch. In other words, carbohydrate on the cat's tongue. You'd find taste buds for protein and amino acids because that's the diet of a cat. Our stomach has uh, about one seventh the amount of hydrochloric acid as a cat's stomach because the cat needs all this acid to digest their high protein, high meat diet. Our intestinal tract is very long for digesting the, the complex sugars a cat's intestinal tract is, is quite short, so it can get rid of the remnants of partially digested food. Uh, there's, there's, well, there, the, the discussion goes on and on and on. And for those of you who are, who are online for learning about 
what people eat from our anatomy and physiology, the discussion can be easily found and it's absolutely clear and consistent. Just to summarize uh, the stomachs that I've talked to you about, I, I wanna make something really clear is that when you go to the grocery store, you don't have to choose, let's see, today I'll make myself trim by picking these foods and tomorrow I'll make myself healthy by picking alternative foods. No, no folks, the same foods that make you fat make you sick and the same foods that cause you to be trim and attractive make you healthy. You know, there's no dilemma here. Everything is consistent. Let's talk about high carbohydrate diets. Uh, what I recommend is that you eat about 90% of your diet as starches. These are, these are parts of plants that are loaded with calories. And it should be about 90%. And that's based not upon getting out, out a dietetic handbook or, or getting your scale out. It's based on eyeballing your plate. About 90% of the food should be starches. About 10% should be vegetables and fruits. And that's the basic McDougall diet. Starches, <clears throat> let's talk about starches for a minute. Plants and only plants use the energy of sun to convert water from the ground and carbon, di carbon dioxide from the air through a process known as photosynthesis into sugar. Only plants can do this. And plants take some of that sugar they, they make, they use it for their daily activities, for growth, for movement, but they take a large part of that sugar that they make and they, uh, they turn it in from simple sugar into chains of sugar, amylose and amylopectin. These are chains of sugar that are also known as starches. And what they do is they store these starches in various plant parts. And the reason they store them in various plant parts is so that they can become anew after winter is over. In the spring and summer, they can sprout, they can germinate but they have to have that concentrated nugget of energy available for the new plant to get started in life. Now we have below ground storage organs, and these would be, <clears throat> these would be rhizomes, potatoes, roots, sweet potatoes. And uh, these below ground storage organs, they're very complete as far as nutrition is concerned. You can live on them and water alone. The potato is known as the anti-scurvy vegetable. They're complete add a little bit of B12, which we can talk about in another discussion. Your above ground storage organs, which are your seeds, your legumes and your grains, they're deficient in A and C. And so you have to add a little bit of fruit or vegetable if you're going to consume largely above ground storage organs. How much? Not much, maybe a slice of orange or a, a floweret of broccoli will give you enough A and C to meet all of your needs. <clears throat> so these are what's, what uh, starches are. They're, they're built by plants, primarily for the plant's use, but we use them as a source of energy. Let's look at the history of starch eating. And uh, I, this is a good place to start with Native Americans. Uh, this is a coin that was put out about 10 years ago. It was a dollar coin. And uh, what it represents is Native Americans. Uh, it represents the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, which is the diet of, of people who, who as, as far as we're concerned, originated North and South in Central America. Corn, beans, and squash was their diet. In Central America, the Aztecs and the Mayans, they, listed, they existed for 9,000 years as the people of the corn. They fought battles, they had children, they did athletic events. They went through tough times, they went through good times. They were farmers, they were sailors, they were, you know, they, they were a complete successful civilization living on corn. Uh, if you go a little further south, what you find is uh, in the Andes, potatoes were in a very important food. In fact, even today, there are 400 to 600 different species of potatoes that are grown in the Andes. And this is the food, primary food that's been for people in South America, Incas are some of the best examples, for 1300 years. They talk about uh, the importance of potatoes in these civilizations. What they would do during tough times is they would freeze dried potatoes and store them in, in dry huts 
And you could do that in the Andes because at night, up at the high altitude, the potatoes froze. And in the daytime, with sun shining, the potatoes were heated up, so they freeze dried. And they would store these potatoes for as long as 10 years. And it got them through some difficult times. Uh, wheat and barley. That was the diet of, of people in what was known as the breadbasket of the world. You know, somewhere between five and 8,000 years, people lived on wheat and barley as their primary food. Remember the breadbasket of the world. And rice, most of you would relate to, uh, to the Asian populations living on rice for 10,000 years, that's been the diet. I'd like to introduce you to uh, one of our speakers at an advanced study weekend, Nathaniel Domini. He's an anthropologist and an evolutionary biologist. He studies ancient people, their bones, their teeth, their genetics. And uh, he tries to figure out what people ate in the past. And he came to some important discoveries. And the discovery is, is that we are, we are uh, uh, derived as a line of, uh, of primates. And uh, we started at lesser primates, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and you know the tree of offspring is a little bit more complex than that. But we had a population of, of monkeys and uh, lesser primates that lived around the equator and still do today. Uh, these, the diet of these, for example, gorillas and chimpanzees is primarily fruits and perishable vegetables. Uh, they eat a little bit of animal food, termites and occasional rodent, but it's uh, primarily fruits and vegetables. As a result, you have to live in an environment that has fruits and vegetables growing all year round, and that's the equatorial zones. What happened in the, uh, the evolution of the primate to the human being is we developed the ability to digest starch. There's an enzyme that's produced, it's uh, called amylase, uh, which digests starch. And these amylase producing enzymes are produced by genetic material, copies of DNA that uh, allow for the formation of this starch enzyme. If you look at the copies of DNA in, in the genetic makeup of a chimpanzee, or a gorilla, you find that they have two copies of this am 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 amylase gene. They have two copies, so they can produce amylase to digest starch. In the evolution of the human being, the number of copies of amylase producing genes triples, quadruples, or even greater as much as 16 times, 16 copies of this amylase and producing uh, enzyme. Uh, or, or gene is present to produce the enzyme. So we developed this ability to digest starch and this allowed us to escape from the equator. It allowed us to migrate all over the planet and conquer planet earth. Rather than being tied to the equator like your lesser primates, your monkeys are, is that uh, the, because of our ability to digest starch, we were able to leave the equator where the fruits and perishable vegetables are always plentiful. And when fall and winter came, we just dug underground. And we pulled up uh, roots and potatoes and other kinds of underground storage organs. And eventually we also, we also harnessed uh, above ground storage organs. Dr. Dominey came and spoke at uh, one of our weekends and let's see what he has to say. And so what, what do we tell our, uh, our friends and relatives who tell us that we're primarily eat, meat eaters because we're hunter gatherers <laughs> with an emphasis on hunter because that's, you know, the man thing to do and gathering is the woman thing to do. That's a, that's a myth. Hunters and gatherers, the majority of their calories come from plant foods. So that's, that's a myth. So hunters and gatherers, the majority of all the calories that any hunting and gathering population gets comes from its plant foods. So that's, that's what's most reliable. Uh, meat is just too unpredictable. You can't, you can't rely on it. So kind of, it kind of as, a, as, a, as a summary statement, uh, as an expert anthropologist, uh, you know, you, you've spent your whole life studying the human diet and its relationship to teeth and bones and chemicals and genes and so on. Your conclusion is the human being is a starchivore. <laughs> Can I, can I uh, use that in my new book? Sure, sure. 
Thank you very much. Sure, thanks a lot. Thank you. And of course, out of that book came the Stark Solution. And this is an important for, thing for, for us to face for just a minute is what we're talking about when it comes to hunter gatherers, we're talking about gender bias, about sexism. You know, the men who always want to uh, accomplish the glory, uh, they went out for a hunt. And occasionally they were able to harness an animal. And sometimes they were able to get it back before it spoiled. And they got all the glory, but who was back collecting the real calories for that particular village? It was the grandparents, the women, the children. It was the gatherers. The idea of hunter gatherers is completely backwards. It was the gatherers that provided for a community and the hunters, they just got a little extra glory, I guess. Now, what initial, initial studies uh, which fostered the idea of hunter gathering and that's what we were as hunters with an emphasis uh, on the word hunter in, in terms of hunter gathering is because of confusion that uh, archeologists had in, in their initial studies uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s. And, what would they would find around the fire pit uh, of a, a particular archeologic site is they'd find the bones and they'd find knives, instruments to cut the bones, to cut the flesh of the animal, and they would find cuts in the bones. And so that's all the evidence they had. So they came away with the idea that, you know, hunter gatherers, they must've just eaten meat because that's all we could find around the fire pit. I mean, corn husks are not gonna last for eons but bones and stone tools are gonna to last for eons. But modern, modern archeology span has looked at things completely differently. They started studying, they've looked closely into the mouth into the gastrointestinal tract and into the feces that were petrified hundreds of thousands of years ago. And it was kind of surprised me that I've actually found a research paper that was just published in 2021, which talks about examining the, uh, the stool, the, the microbiome, you know, the feces petrified of uh, humans that were around 600,000 years ago, both Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, and identified that they ate starch. And we have a large amount of evidence that talked about how the Neanderthals actually ate cooked starch 50,000 years ago. And cooking was one of the things that made us who we are. Uh, in other words, when you were able to cook a starch, you were able to release enough calories so that uh, you could develop this powerful brain that we have. The brain burns 20% of the daily calories that you consume. And the brain highly prefers sugar as far as the source of energy. So anyway, we have this uh, evolution, which was based upon not eating fish as far as the brain goes, not eating animal foods as far as the brain goes, but eating starch is what allowed us, cooked starch allowed us to develop the brain power that we have. 170,000 years ago, this is a uh, cave uh, in South Africa. They found underground storage organs associated with this particular 170,000. You know, you've been told that the agricultural revolution took place 10,000 years ago. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, people have been starch eaters. They've been harnessing various kinds of starches for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, there was a uh, interesting site uh, that was in southern, uh, southern Chile where they were actually able to find organic materials that had been buried in peat moss in a bog. You know, most, most of the materials found were, were organic materials, very difficult to find. But in this particular village, they found uh, actual whole plant parts. They identified 44 ed edible plants from this village and 22 medicinal plants. And that's 1400 years ago. Well, we took a group to, uh, to this particular area of the world. We took one of our adventure travel trips to, uh, to Peru and to various other parts of uh, South America. And it was kind of interesting when we went to Peru with this, our group of people, we had about 40 folks that came along with us on our McDougall adventure trip is everybody was trim in the population except for you when you went to the restaurants. And in the restaurants, the waiters and the chefs were all overweight. Well, if you know a little bit about the, the people who lived at that time, that's only 20 years ago, in Peru, they were primarily starch eaters, potato eaters. 
And only the wealthy or those who worked in restaurants were able to eat the rich Western food. And if you notice here, that there's Ann Wheat right there. A picture of Ann? Anyway. So uh, the Four Corners, uh, there's something called Four Corners potatoes discovered 10,000 years ago. This is in an area of the Southwestern United States. So we have remnants of potato eating. Uh, here we can go back on grains 105,000 years ago to Mozambique. And what they found is they found these grains located between the teeth of the skeletons. And they found them on tools. And they found them in their poop, starch grains. And they determined that these people were primarily starch eaters. Here's a uh, uh, examination from Western Peru. Uh, this particular skeletal finding is 8,000 years old. You can see the teeth there. And between the teeth, you see the granules. These are starch granules. Anyway, our eating of a rich diet, a diet for kings and queens is a blip in human history. It's only been real popular for the last 50 years and it's only been around for 100 to 150 years. Otherwise, the other million years of human evolution of human existence were almost exclusively starch eaters, except in the extremes of the environment. Why, why would we change all of a sudden in the 20th century? It makes no sense at all. Well, if you look around, you can see the results of giving up starch. Uh, as far as starch and performance, uh, soldiers know this. Uh, Roman soldiers used to ask their leaders not to feed them meat prior to battle, instead feed them grains because they knew they were much better fighters. And Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan both took armies and conquered the known world with armies that were fueled by corn, not maize. Corn, corn is what they referred to various grains like rice and wheat and barley. That was their fuel that allowed them to conquer the known world. The story of the gladiators is one of, uh, of vegan starch eaters. A uh, gray plot uh, unearthed about 30 years ago that was uh, present 1800 years ago in Ephesus, which is a, a part of uh, present day Turkey where they once had a lot of coliseums and gladiatorial events. And they found a grave site there. <clears throat> and when they unearthed the grave site, they found uh, that there were 22 gladiators in this grave site. And they analyzed the bones of the gladiators and they determined the long-term diet based upon the strontium and calcium ratios that were present. They determined that the long-term diet of these gladiators was vegan, which fits in with the historical descriptions of gladiators as the barley eaters. They lived on a diet of barley and beans. Why do you think they lived on a diet of barley and beans? This was the most unforgiving sport that I can think of. Some of the skeletons that they unearthed had trident holes in their heads. You know, you want to be out there performing. You want to have strength. You want to have endurance so you can survive. And of course, those uh, owners who put you up for this contest, they wanted you to win also. So you ate a diet that gave you the best performance. As far as uh, gladiators of today, I can't think of any, any bigger test of endurance and strength than our marathon and triathlon winners and runners. And if you'll notice that the winners and runners of our triathlons come primarily from Ethiopia and Kenya. You know, the Chicago Marathon, the Honolulu Marathon, the Boston Marathon, were all won by Kenyans and Ethiopians. And what's noted about these runners is that they eat a diet where 80% of their energy comes from maize. You know, you call it corn, maize. 80% of their fuel comes from starch, from corn. Uh, one brush that we had with, with fame when it came to the athletic, athletic and performance was when Carl Lewis followed the McDougal diet. And he was uh, a whole article on him following the McDougal diet in the August 1992 issue of Runner's World. Well, I met Carl Lewis in Minneapolis when we were ready to go on Twin Cities Live and he came in with his entourage to the green room. And he was complaining that he couldn't find a diet that would allow him to lose a couple ounces, which would cause him to be a faster person. 
because every diet he followed, he either got weak or got sick and he couldn't perform. And I said, hey, Carl, I said, why don't you try this? And so he did. And he subsequently set the record for the 100 meter dash. He won three long jumps that as far as I know have not been broken yet. And he won multiple relays and he retired as an old man. Carl Lewis, you want to listen to an interview of Carl Lewis that I did on my radio show and his story about how the McDougall diet helped him. We have uh, three published studies in respected journals, uncontested to date, which show the benefits of eating a high starch diet, a diet of rice, corn, potatoes, breads, pastas, etc. The uh, first study is uh, one we did in of our participants at our, our center, it was over a 10 year period of time. We looked at 1,703 participants that had been through over the last 10 years. We excluded no one. And we looked at what happened to them over that period of time. And that period of time happened to be seven days. So what happened to these people in one week is the average weight loss was 3.1 pounds, seven days. Now, there are many other things that happen with these people, like 90% of them were able to reduce or stop their blood pressure and or, and or diabetic medications and cholesterol came down 22 points and et cetera. Uh, the uh, randomized control trial, which is the, the ultimate in scientific research was done at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. And what they do is they looked at the long-term benefits of the McDougall diet on primarily multiple sclerosis, but they studied a lot of other parameters. And what they found was they found that 85% of people, 85% of people were compliant for 12 months. If you take a look at this chart here, you see the red line represents the control group. They were asked to stay on the Western diet. This is a randomized control trial. You have a control group plus you have the intervention group. So the red dots, red line represents the control group. They ate a diet of about 40% fat. The intervention group were the people who came to our program. And they were taught just along with the rest of the people at our program. They were taught the McDougall diet, which is a diet based on starches with fruits and vegetables. It is a vegan diet. And you see the drop in their fat intake overnight. But the important thing to look at is what happened to their fat intake over the next 12 months they were compliant with the diet for 12 months. We only had an initial interaction with them for 10 days in the beginning, but the diet was so effective at causing them good health and the food was so good, they stayed on it. 85% of people for a year, you can't get people to take pills that long. The average weight loss uh, over a 12 month period of time was uh, nearly 20 pounds. They got a drop in cholesterol, which uh, was about 20 points. Uh, we had an independent study, an observational study done in New Zealand. And this was a study of a community-based program that learned the McDougall diet. And this program in New Zealand brags that they have the best weight loss of any program on the entire planet Earth. Well, they happened to use the McDougall diet and they lost uh, 25 pounds on average at the end of a year. So we've been studied, uh, the results are clear. Uh, let me talk to you about some of the long-term results. We don't have scientific studies on these, but I know you like to hear about what happens to people over years and decades and so on. So I'm, I'm gonna share this with you, some of the, uh, the examples. I'm not gonna say too much about them and you can just take a look at their pictures. But I, what I want you to understand is that you should expect these results. Okay, with Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, Nutrisystem, et cetera. Their ads will contain a disclaimer that says this is the best case scenario. Don't expect these results. Ladies and gentlemen, expect these results. If you follow the program that I teach, you should expect this will happen to you. Of course, you have to follow the program. Let's take a look, 90 pounds here. And you'll notice that these people have maintained the weight loss for like 31 years in this case. This lady uh, in her initial picture, she says that this was a photo of me in January, 2007, which she didn't like. She dreaded the photo. 
And then she started, she changed her diet and she started uh, taking photos of herself after her dietary change. And she said, she says, now I can't pick one that I like. I like them all. And she went on a trip with us, one of the adventure trips. It goes at a pretty steady rate. The average weight loss you can expect to be greater if you start out heavier. Those who are close to trim body weight, they're likely not gonna lose as fast. But the bigger people will get the greatest weight loss initially. As you get down to trim body weight, the weight losses will occur more slowly. But following the diet strictly without any added exercise, you can expect six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 pound weight losses um, every month. And uh, shouldn't be hard for you to get these kind of results. But you know, again, you must ma maintain the kind of diet that we teach you. Uh, <clears throat> This fellow right here, he changed his diet because he couldn't play ball with his kids. This fellow was a chief financial officer of the Dairy State, Wisconsin. Lost 40 pounds, but the important thing is he's well. Didn't just lose the weight, he, he's well now. All right, so you know, I know some of you uh, are very interested in losing weight as fast as you can. And there's also another group of people I'd like to address and uh, cover both groups together. And those are the fat vegans and people are interested in losing weight as quick as possible. Both of the recommendations I have apply to both groups. The fat vegan. The fat vegan presents a, a, an opportunity for me. Uh, these are people who are already convinced that they ought to stop eating animals they're strong people. They've stood up against their mother-in-law, their doctor, their dietitian. They're industrious. They've taken the trouble to find different foods so that they can be vegan. But unfortunately, they themselves do not present an appearance of good health. I call them the fat vegan. I wrote an article in my December 2008 newsletter titled The Fat Vegan. In the book, The Starch Solution is a chapter called The Fat Vegan. You would think I would have offended a lot of people by writing these chapters so titled. I didn't notice I offended anybody. You know, I actually, I, I hope that what the people that I was talking to would look at what I was trying to do as an effort to get them to be more effective at saving animals and saving the earth. You know, I, I want vegan to be synonymous with trim and healthy and active and young and strong and earth changing. But unfortunately, too many, too many people, even though they follow a vegan diet, don't make the kind of appearance that other folks can accept. And they look at you and they say, well, you know what? If I have to sacrifice my personal appearance and my health to save the planet and the animals, I just may not do it. Well, that's not a choice that you have to have. Uh, the fat vegan, let's start by giving up the fake foods. Uh, these are not part of the McDougal diet. These are isolated concentrated soy products or isolated fat products when it comes to cheese. And they provide too many calories and plus they're just concoctions of chemicals. They're not real food. The uh, next, next thing that needs to be corrected in people who are fat vegans or those who wanna lose weight as fast as possible, you gotta get rid of the nuts and you got to get rid of the olives and av avocados, avocados and seeds. I mean, these are delicacies. I, I remember when I was growing up, and this is my family here. When I, when I was growing up, uh, as a special treat, my dad would get a five pound bag of nuts in the shell. And the six of us McDougals, we would uh, spend the next week with a pick and a and a nutcracker and opening these shells. And it would take us a whole week to go through the whole five pounds. But that was then. I mean, now what is it? It's just a matter of unscrewing the top and inhaling. Well, I, you know, nuts and seeds are probably the biggest offender when it comes to the fat vegan. And uh, a lot of these uh, folks are interested in the, in the health benefits of certain foods like coconuts. Well, you know, they, they didn't put coconuts in the hardest shell of all for, re, for no reason at all. They're supposed to be hard to get at. So uh, the other thing that you would want to give up if you were a fat vegan or if you want to lose weight as fast as possible is you wanted to give up dried fruits. 
you know, I can eat 20 apples dried in the time I can eat one or two apples fresh. Calories count. A juice, you don't improve the quality of a fruit or vegetable by hitting it a thousand times with a steel blade. You release simple sugars. That's why people like juices, so they taste sweeter. Well, that sweetness it comes at a price that raises insulin levels. These are sugar calories that do count. The body would prefer to burn the sugar and leave the fat in your body fat. And another restriction that I place on people who want to lose weight rapidly is I'd restrict their fruit intake. And the reason is, is because you're so familiar with fruits. So you, you know, you could eat 20 fruits a day. Calories count. So losing weight, let's cut the fruits, even the fresh fruits down to maybe one or two a day, maybe none. Breads, breads and bagels, uh, they're refined, concentrated calories. And as a result, when you change a wheat berry into a wheat flour, you increase the calorie concentration. Now, one saving grace for pasta is it's made with water. And so as a result of the added water, you decrease the calorie concentration. So not as, as, as calorie dense, but for rapid weight loss, for people who are interested in the McDougall program for maximum weight loss, you'll wanna give up the breads and bagels. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Just remember that I said, we're gonna give up the breads and bagels, but I wanna qualify that for you in just a moment. Uh, 28 years ago, when I was 46 years old, I wrote the book, the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. It was as a, as a result of demand from you. I, I've always considered myself a medical doctor, you know, wanting to help stamp out disease, help people with kidney problems, diabetes, heart trouble, cancer, et cetera. I, I never considered myself a diet doctor, but because I got so much demand for me to write a weight loss book that I, I yielded. And uh, in 1994, we published the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. It's still a national bestseller, you know, and it still gets five star reviews. Well, what the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss told you was this, is one way to get more weight loss is to decrease the starches and increase the non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. So, Non-starchy green and yellow vegetables would be things like broccoli and kale and lettuce and celery, you know, the traditional diet foods. Typically you'd eat maybe 10% at most, five, 10% of your meal plan would be uh, these non-starchy fruits and, or vegetables. And maybe 5% would be fruit. The other 80, 90% would be starch. That would be, you know, the typical McDougall program. Well, if you wanna lose weight faster, how about bumping up the non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. You know, more traditional diet foods, more broccoli, more cauliflower, more celery, more kale, maybe to 25% and only 75% of your diet is now starch. You're pushing it. You're pushing the weight loss efforts uh, by doing that. And then you could go as high as 50-50. Anything more than 50-50, that means 50 starch, 50% non-starchy non vegetables, uh, you're getting into an area where you're out of control again. You're hungry. You're not getting the satisfaction that you need. So I would be very careful about pushing this too hard. So the uh, maximum weight loss program avoids the, the soy products, the nuts and seeds, the avocados. If you want to really push the weight loss, you can make the food taste less tasty by leaving all the salt off. Now, eating salt will increase your calorie intake because you'll enjoy the food more. You avoid uh, dried fruits, fruits, simple sugars, and breads, bagels, and pastas on the maximum weight loss program. The other thing, I, I must put a special plea out to those of you, probably not the fat vegan, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm being, come to conclusions that are not correct, was, but, but a lot of people eat out. Uh, and this is your downfall. You eat out, you, you, you go into the restaurant, you say, I'm vegan, or I'm low fat vegan. Or if you put oil on my food, I'll die. And what do they do? They put oil in your food. You can count on it. They put oil in your food. Anyway, the principles that I just shared with you are so solid that they always work. You know, I, I, I don't think I'll ever have to apologize to somebody and say, you know, I taught you the, the McDougall diet 
with variations in the maximum weight loss and you didn't hit term body weight, just like I predicted. I, I haven't seen it yet. Don't think I'll see it in the future. Let's take another look uh, at, at star tutors, skinny people from around the world. Okay, well, I hope you are thoroughly indoctrinated into the importance of starch. Because if you aren't, you don't understand this and you're back into the situation you were before the, this lecture started. But let me just take this to one further extreme. You know, I've taught you the basic McDougall diet, which is going to solve the weight problems for almost all of you. I've taught you some variations and what you may be doing wrong, even though your intentions are right by following the maximum weight loss program. And let me show you the extremes of diet and what it can do for you. And I, I resort to one of my mentors, uh, Walter Kempner from Duke University. Walter Kempner sh showed me with his work how powerful diet therapy can be. And he also showed me how difficult it is to cause nutritional deficiencies on simple diets, even diets that contain sugar. Walter Kempner has uh, an unprecedented record of curing people with severe heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, amazing work. N not, not even coming close to uh, the benefits of the drug and the device industries and the surgery industries don't even come close to the results that Walter Kempner got. He was at Duke University for seven decades for two decades, he offered uh, the primary financial support for Duke University with his rice program. The rice diet consists of white rice. Why do you use white rice? Because he felt it would be more acceptable, uh, more available. Certainly brown rice will work just as well. Fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. And those people who are losing too much weight, he would add as much as 2000 calories of white sugar to their diet to prevent them from losing excess weight. The Kempner diet treated all kinds of problems. As I mentioned, high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, and so on. It's a, it's a diet that I still use, but it's the diet for the nearly dead in my practice, not for the average person. It's a diet that is 94% sugar, and yet essentially 100% of the type two diabetics were cured with a diet that was 94% sugar. Morbid obesity, he published studies that showed that you could get better results from changing to the rice diet as opposed to having bariatric surgery. There's a group of people who lost 
at least 99 pounds to get into the into the study. The average weight loss is 141 pounds. Anyway, out of 106 patients, uh, 43 achieved normal body weight, their blood pressure, triglycerides, et cetera, all improved greatly. Walter Kempner uses a, a weight chart that I wanted you to be familiar with. And the reason I wanted you to become familiar with Kempner's weight chart, and here it is, and you can find it in my November 2015 newsletter, is Walter Kempner offered a height versus weight chart that allows you to at least be comfortable by the fact that you're not losing too much weight. It's gonna be a big deal for you if you've lost 50, 70, 80, 100 pounds, dealing with previous friends and family, they're gonna think you're sick, you have AIDS or you have cancer, or, you know, they're gonna to come to some conclusions that aren't right. And they will, because uh, they have a different opinion of you, an impression of you from the past, they will, um, they'll be worried about you. Well, people will meet you new will think you look really good. You need some kind of confidence that you're not being becoming too thin. And so I would encourage you to look at Walter Kemmer's recommendations as to weight versus your height. All right, you're losing too much weight. Well, the way you do that is you do the opposite of the maximum weight loss program. In this case, what you eat is more nuts and seeds and breads and dry fruits, et cetera. And you cut down on your starches, vegetables, and fruits, and you put on more weight. So the question, why am I so fat? That's what we started here a few minutes ago. Why am I so fat? It's because of starch deficiency and fat excess. Just gonna show you a couple studies to conclude. Uh, this is Lister's classic work that was published in 1987. What they did in this experiment, they housed these people, is they fed them diets that you were able to hide the fat in the food like muffins and stews and soups and sandwiches and desserts and so on. You're able to hide the butter, the mayonnaise, the vegetable oil, et cetera, in the food. So you can control the fat intake without changing the quality of the food. And what they did was by spontaneously reducing the fat intake from say 45% of the calories to 15% of the calories is without any conscious thought by just decreasing the amount of fats in the prepared foods that people couldn't tell the difference whether it was a high fat, medium fat or low fat day. What they were able to do is just is to reduce the calorie intake by 600 calories. Why did they do that? Because they reduce the fat. And when you reduce the fat and you let people eat ad libitum, then they increase the carbohydrate satisfying, the, the appetite satisfying carbohydrates. You don't have to do this with any suffering. You don't have to do this with any conscious effort. All you have to do is make some simple changes, get the fat out, get the carbohydrate in. Now, about the time that uh, Mary and I published the first book, which was called Making the Change, because we knew the most difficult thing would be to help people make the change, was back in 1978. I was going to Michigan State University at that time. Uh, I had uh, suffered some major health problems, but I lived in this dormitory. This is called Schneider Hall. And uh, in this Schneider Hall, they had a cafeteria and you could get as much free food as you wanted. And believe me, I ate as much free food as I wanted. Plenty of eggs, plenty of bacon, pork chops, et cetera. Uh, just not to divert too much into it. Uh, three months into my college stay at uh, Michigan State University, eating that kind of food, I had a massive stroke. <clears throat> and I know that was just the end of some very unhealthy eating. But anyway, at this time, an experiment was done with uh, moderately overweight college age men, you know, like myself. And what they did is these men who were living in a college situation, eating in the dormitories, all they did is they asked them to eat 12 slices of bread a day in addition to whatever else they wanted to eat. They didn't tell them to eat less bacon or you know, fewer pork chops or drink less milk. They just said, you have to eat these 12 slices of bread a day. And so they did, they ate 12 slices of bread a day for two months. And at the end of two months, those who ate the white bread lost an average of 14 pounds. Those who ate the brown bread lost an average of 19 pounds. And they did this, they, they, they did this by, by displacing the amount of fat in the total diet, reducing it, the amount of fat in the total diet, because you ate the bread and so you ate less bacon, you ate less pork chops, you ate fewer, less butter and you increase the amount of carbohydrate satisfying 
calories in the form of bread. Again, this, this was made unconsciously. Spontaneous, you don't have to think about this. There's no pain. There's no sickness. There's no suffering. There's no surgery. There are no pills. All you have to do is make some conscious effort to change the composition of your foods. All right, so I, I, hopefully I got most of you uh, oriented in the right direction. You understand what the basic problem is, and that's the composition of the food. We eat a diet that's too dense in calories, has too much fat to wear, and not enough carbohydrate to satisfy the hunger drives. Mm, hopefully you are ready to make a full-blown change to the McDougal diet, but if you're not, what I'd like to do is offer you a more starch challenge. Eat more starch. I want you to do just like the overweight men did at Michigan State University back when I was in college. I want you to add 12 slices of bread a day to your current meal plan. Well, if that doesn't appeal to you, how about four cups of uh, boiled spaghetti noodles? How about three cups of cooked beans? Four baked potatoes, I'm not saying and, I'm saying or. Four mashed potatoes, four cups of boiled corn, four cups of steam. Just add, you pick one of these, you love these foods, add that to your meal plan every day. And what will happen to you is spontaneously, without any thought, you'll reduce your calorie intake by six to 900 calories a day. Now, if that's not sensible weight loss, sustainable weight loss, to eat more foods that you enjoy, I don't know what is. That's my challenge. And if you want some help with that challenge, we'll be glad to help you. You can go to our website. There's a free 12 day program there for you, but I encourage uh, most of you to seriously think about joining us for a 12 day internet based telemedicine telehealth program that our team will put together for you, which will pretty much guarantee you're gonna make some substantial changes in your life and we can help you through it. And we have some sports specialists, we have all kinds of great education that will help you through this time. And that's found at www.drmcdougall.com. It's the 12 day internet. What are you waiting for? Oh, good grief, you spent enough years not as happy and healthy as you should be. We'll help you get over the tough ones. I'm Dr. John McDougall, thank you very much for listening. That was amazing, Dr. McDougall. You put your presentations are incredible, your slides and all the audio. You really take a lot of time and effort to do this. So we appreciate it so much. Well, you know, uh, what I hope is that people who are interested in weight loss will understand, you know, just how profound the information is as to why they're in trouble. They're not, they don't have a, they don't have mental problems. They don't have physical problems. They've got choice problems. That's what, that's what the, the and once, they're, once they understand that the only way you're going to get control of the situation is to eat starch and to get rid of the fat, eat carbohydrates, get rid of the oils. Until you understand that, you, you're helpless. You know, it's just too powerful. You're hungry, so you eat. You eat foods that are so calorie dense, so, so laden with fat, so deficient in carbohydrate that you just keep piling on the pounds. You're out of control but you're not gonna change your personality. You're not gonna, well, you can, I suppose you can change your stomach size by talking to a surgeon. But you, you, know, you can fix these things just by picking the right foods. I showed you populations of millions of people, past and present, millions who live on starch-based diets. None of them were overweight. You know, they're all active people, having children, families, they're, they're hardworking athletic competing, war fighting, living on starch. You know, you, you've been, you've been, unfortunately you've been, you've been sold a bill of goods by industry that has condemned you to sickness. And unfortunately these days it's condemning us to a, a dead planet. Yeah, well, I, you know, I agree with you, obviously, and I do everything you say, but we still have vegans that are so worried about their omega-3 fatty acids and that they'll drop dead if they don't pound down the nuts and seeds every day or take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. And I think it's fine if they're not struggling with their weight, but if they are, I don't understand why they wouldn't give it a low-fat diet at least to try. I, I, I can, you know, faced with, with solid information, I don't understand why people don't do it either. Um, it's hard to change, I guess, and that's why we've 
you know, we've written 13 national best-selling books. We ran all these weekend programs, these adventure trips and the resort where we locked people up for 12 days, my hospital-based program where we locked them up for 12 days. Uh, and now, you know, we're entertaining people over the internet. Uh, it's not easy to change, but it's like so many things in life. You look back and you say, why didn't I do this before? Why did I wait so long? You know, well, you, you don't have to wait. And uh, again, the, the program's free on the website. You can do it. Esther did it. Thousands of people have done it. Hundreds of thousands of people have done it. But if you need a little extra help, particularly if you're on medications or you have some concern about your health, let Dr. Lim evaluate what's going on, give you some instruction on getting off the drugs. We get nearly 90% of people off their medications. But let me put it another way. We get, uh, we get nearly 90% of the medications for diabetes and high blood pressure to be stopped or reduced. But I suppose it'd be the same way. 90% of the people, we get them off medications. I think that's probably fair too. You know, listen, sick people take drugs. Healthy people don't. Sick people uh, have one surgery schedule after another. Healthy people don't. Get out of the business. The problem is the food. It's really that simple. I know there's no money behind it. But it's, it's really that simple. If you're, if you're, if you're going to listen to, uh, to McDonald's new Air, C and Land Burger as the ultimate nutrition, then you're going to end up with some serious problems. If you look at uh, the past history, you know, I, I mentioned up there on one of the slides, I showed you all those skinny people. I ask you to think about your ancestors. You know, there are a lot of people from all over the world who still have grandmas and grandpas who live on a starch-based diet. You know, if you happen to be Japanese or Chinese and you have grandma and grandpa at home, they're still eating rice and vegetables. They haven't switched to McDonald's double cheeseburgers, not in most cases. You know, my Hawaiian patients, I, I used to take care of the grandma and grandpa, they lived in taro and breadfruit, working in the fields. Whereas the, the Hawaiian heritage people, they're some of the fattest, sickest, most diabetic people on this planet. How about, how about the Native American? How about the American Indian, which we talk so much about these days about Native Americans is, you know, what more abused population of people can you think of than these folks? You know, right now, 60, 80% of them are obese. You know, most have gallbladder disease, uh, particularly when they get into middle age. They're very ill. Why? Because not only, not only they have been, they, they've been deprived of their heritage, a diet of corn and beans and squash. That's the heritage of the Native American people. But they've been force fed the rich Western diet and all kinds of governmental food supplementation programs. You know, show show some ethnic pride, stand up and say, look, I'm gonna eat like grandma and grandpa did. I'm gonna live on rice or corn. Well, how many, how many Hispanic people do we have here who can think back even in their home now, the grandma and grandpa are living on beans and corn tortillas. You can see it, I know you can see it. I, 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 can't, I can't be the only one that sees this. You know, Dr. McDougall, I can understand why people want to eat nuts and seeds, you know, an avocado, because they're, you know, they're really quite delicious, although they're calorie dense. But we've got like a, a big debate now, even among the plant based doctors, that oil is now all of a sudden this health food that's going to be helpful to losing weight and to reversing heart disease. And I don't, are you, are you I, familiar don't, with I, don't that? I don't understand these people. I, I don't, I, they, they don't understand basic science is what the problem is. I showed you the studies that show the fat you eat, the fat you wear. You know, uh, they, they just, I, I, showed you, I showed you a million years of human history. You know, I, 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 you have to go through so much denial to come to those kinds of theories that eating oil makes you thin. Eating oil makes you wear oil. That's what happens, you wear it on your skin you get oily skin, oily hair, acne, blackheads, whiteheads, and you wear it under your skin. You get, you get a, a sebaceous cysts and big fat thighs and abdomens that hang over your belt. I don't care whether it's a health food, olive oil or whatever health food, whatever oil. The fat you eat is the fat you wear, ladies and gentlemen. There's no other way of cutting it. 
That's what the body does with the excess fat calories. It stores them away. It's the most efficient thing for the body to do. Again, start with the idea that we're the at least one of the best creations of all nature. Why would we be? Why would we be designed with these kinds of mistakes? Um, we're not. We're we, we we can do. We can be everything that we ought to be. We can preserve the temple, so to speak, by following the right set of rules. You know, every religion you look at teaches you a similar thing that I've tried to teach you. It teaches you that rich foods make people sick, and diets based on plant foods causes you to be strong and healthy. You know, I often talk about the uh, the first chapter of Daniel in the Bible, where Daniel's men came to a new kingdom, and the new kingdom they ate a lot of meat and rich foods there. And Daniel asked the gatekeeper of the new kingdom, "Can we stay on our diet of pulses and water?" And you compare our men with your men after ten days. And 10 days later, they found them stronger and trimmer, better complexions. Every adjective that you can think of is described in different versions of the Bible as to how Daniel's men, who lived on pulses and water, which are vegetables and water, the starches and water, that's 2,600 years ago. This is your religion. And we could go to uh, other faiths and we could find similar teachings. People weren't stupid 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. They could look around and see what was happening. So you have this mass blindness today in our society. I just don't understand it. Open your eyes. Yeah. Well, oil wasn't even a food for throughout most of human history. There was no way to process it. Uh, they used to, used to light lamps with it. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like taking a few questions that I, were- I, I would love to take some questions. Okay, guys, if you submit them in advance, you get a greater chance because uh, that's just the way it works. So this is from Sherry. A lot of the high fat, low carb people are touting collagen as important for maintaining elasticity of the skin. While none of us in this community want to turn to high fat, especially if it comes from animal sources, I'd be interested in knowing if there's any science at all behind the benefits of collagen for hair, nail, and skin. I, I don't, you don't need any add extra collagen or eat extra collagen. Is that, is that what the question was? Is eating extra collagen going to make your skin better? Yeah, hair, nails, and skin. A lot of people are touting well, the benefits. Just eat hair, nails, and skin. <laughs> I, mean, good, I mean, good grief. You know, people think that if you eat muscle, cow muscle, pig muscle, chicken muscle, that you, get, you grow muscles. You know, people think if you eat fish, that's brain food, you grow bigger brains. What would happen if you, if you ate testicles? You become nuts. Huh. Oh, AJ. <laughs> you, no, you, 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 you would improve your sex drive, AJ. Oh. As a matter of fact, that's not, that's not a, entirely a joke. I mean, you can, from these glandulars, you can get hormones, uh, like from the testicles and adrenals and thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is an excellent example of how you can get hormones from other animals. That's what that's what uh, natural thyroid is. It's armor thyroid. It's made from cow and pig thyroid glands. So eating these glands is not a good idea. In addition, they also transfer microbes over to you like mad cow prions and leukemia viruses and things like that. So you don't want to eat these animals even in the form of medicines. Hey, I, you know, I agree. This question is from Kay. I always wondered what Dr. McDougall thinks of donating blood. Are there any potential obstacles or issues? And are there particular foods to eat before or after to help with recovery? Well, I think it's a, it's a proper thing to do, you know, to donate blood. You know, it helps good grief. You know, I'm sure it's helped somebody in your family. It certainly has helped somebody in my family. It's, it's the right thing to do. As far as harm goes, uh, I fear that someday I would get a blood transfusion from somebody who just walked out of McDonald's. Their blood is so full of grease, it, you know, it's sludging right in the, right in the, uh, in the, in the, in the blood bag. I can just imagine it. You, you got this black bag of blood cells and this big glob of fat on top and they're pushing that in you. Oh boy. Anyway. Uh, no, I, th I think if you're a healthy person, the cleanest blood you're going to have is by eating a good diet. Really, if you eat a high fat diet, your blood is going to be full of fat. And in some cases, they'll actually reject you because you have so much fat in your blood. It's called triglycerides. And as far as taking supplemental iron before or after, not necessary. Get all the iron you want in your vegetable foods. 
Uh, iron is a component, a mineral component that plants pick up from the ground. Just like other minerals, uh, they dissolve in water solutions. The sodium, potassium, calcium, iron, magnesium, etc., are absorbed in the roots of plants. They become part of the roots, stems, leaves, flowers, and fruits of plants. And then we eat the plants. And we take in the minerals and you always get enough iron. Uh, one of the things you may have heard is that eating ascorbic acid, in other words, citrus fruits, increases your iron utilization. And that's true, it does. You may have heard that eating animal foods, you can get a big source of highly usable iron. Yeah, you do, but at a great price. Why would I do that? Uh, there's always enough food. There's always enough iron in the plant kingdom to meet your needs, even if you've donated blood. Great. Thank you. Well, if you need any, I'll be happy to donate to you. What's your blood type, Dr. McDougall? Type O. Okay. Type I don't, I don't... That, 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 you know, if I, if I looked at, what was it, D. Diamino's book about eat for your blood type? Then I would I would probably have had a mass another massive stroke and another heart attack and you know bowel cancer and all kinds of things if I believed in that because I'm a type O type O's are supposed to eat <clears throat> are supposed to eat a high meat diet right and type A's are supposed to eat a high rice diet and the thinking being that Asians eat rice and they have a type A predominance in their blood and Caucasians whites eat heavy meat heavy dairy diet and they have a predominance of type O in their populations. So the whole theory is, is you need to eat based on your blood type. And I'll tell you what I decided I was gonna do a few years back is I was gonna really make the popular book, popular book scene. And what I was gonna do is put out a new diet called eat right for your shoe size diet. And what you would do is if you, if you had little shoes, like you know the Asians used to have because they had little feet then you eat rice. And if you have big shoes, then you, of course, you eat meat. So what do you think of my new diet? The shoe size uh, diet? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an eight and a half and I'm type B. So I'd be, I look forward to reading that book and <laughs> promoting uh, it on the know, show. I mean, it's really that silly and people will, will grasp at straws. Yeah. And hopefully the material I presented for you in the last hour yeah. will make you stop and think about the fact that you know, you're not wrong. Your body's not your enemy. It's just you're following the wrong set of rules and it always works. As I told you, this is not the best case scenario. You will get well, right? I've, I've seen thousands of patients over my years and I've watched other people take care of their patients. I know what's gonna to happen to you. Now, I don't know whether or not you're gonna follow the program, but I do know if you eat a starch-based diet, in other words, you start out in the morning with oatmeal pancakes, waffles, go on for lunch and dinner and you have uh, mushu vegetables over rice and bean burritos. And last night we had, uh, we had a, 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 a tamale pie, Mary, last night? Enchiladas. Enchiladas, yeah, we had bean ch meat enchiladas. And the night before we had bean pizza. Yeah, that was really good. Anyway, if you eat those kinds of foods, you'll end up- But there. we can't eat beans, Dr. McDougall, because Dr. Gundry says they could contain lectins. Yeah, well, again, you know, you find somebody who, who latches onto a little niche and they try and blow it into a whole big diet and a little particle of information they distort. Plant foods are good for you. Lectins are part of plant foods. They're a natural defense system of plants and, you know, I'm just, uh, I, 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 know, I know what people are supposed to eat. It's what they've always eaten. It's what 99.99% .99 of people that walk this earth have eaten. I'm sure 99.99% .99 of people have not avoided lectins or beans, et cetera. But uh, you, you, you have enough basic information, every one of you does, so that you should be able to come to the similar conclusions, especially you folks who have been listening to AJ for so long. You, you know, you, 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 you got to see it. It's so obvious. But I guess that's the way life is, is the, some of the most honest, obvious things are, are lied about. Yeah. Yep. So here's a question from Richard. Somebody who's a type two diabetic that has gastroparesis, can that be reversed? I guess the, both the yeah, diabetes no, and I, the I, I, take care, I take care of people with gastroparesis. 
you know, it's often because uh, gastroparesis is where the intestinal tract is, uh, is the muscles don't work, okay? And you get uh, problems with the food flowing through the bowel, bowels. And, and uh, gastric, of course, implies that's the stomach, but the paresis occurs throughout the entire intestine. And yeah, I've taken care of quite a few people. You just put them on a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and you know, they straighten right out. So not that it would happen every time, but what, what risk do you have to try it? You know, it, I explained to you, it works. It works. And if it's going to work, it's going to work in four months. It's going to cut your food bill by 60 to 80%. You know, what, 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 where's the downside of eating a good diet? Where's the downside of getting off of your pills? You know, sick people take pills. Healthy people don't. The only way I know to, to be safe and to get all the benefits you're looking are to fix the problem. And the problem is the food. Yep. Well, speaking of Dr. Gundry, there's a question not about him, but about beans from Cheryl. And she says, what is your position on the consumption of beans? Should we be eating them at every meal three times a day? If we eat three meals a day, how much is your recommendation of them? And are they a good protein source for aging vegans? Brenda Davis says senior vegans need more protein. Since I love Dr. McDougall, please ask him about beans, tofu, tempeh, vegan proteins, and what he thinks of them for those of us following his program. Well, the first book I wrote uh, that became a national bestseller, a New York Times national bestseller, was called The McDougall Plan. And again, I wrote this from the point of view of being a doctor. I wasn't interested in weight loss at all. And in the recipe section of that book, I put little pictures, uh, one representing beans, peas, and lentils, another representing sugar, another representing salt, etc. I put these little pictures in to identify what the recipes that you might want to particularly avoid and uh, I wanted people who had liver disease, kidney disease, osteoporosis, and or kidney stones to eat less, fewer beans. And the reason is, is beans are 28% protein. And protein has to be metabolized by the liver and kidneys. And it puts extra work on the kidneys. So if you have failing kidneys and liver, you're going to have trouble digesting that extra protein. Extra protein also causes the body to lose bone material. So kidney stones, and uh, which is the result of losing bone material, and osteoporosis, which is the result of losing bone material. That's another case where you should limit your beans, peas, and lentils. I th I, as a general recommendation, I still feel it's, uh, it's reasonable for me to suggest that you eat, on average, a cup of cooked beans a day, if you're in good health. Not if you have kidney disease or liver disease or osteoporosis or kidney stones. But that's a lot. So that's a cup of cooked beans on average a day. I mean, some days you won't have any beans at all. So I don't think you're going to run into any problem about having too many beans. But uh, it's, it's, it's a protein-rich food for sure. But they're tasty, aren't they? And they're filling. <laughs> easy, to, easy, to, easy for people to relate to, to beans. And this is, a, again, one of the not as good as potatoes, though. And people are wondering what your favorite potato is. I don't know. I, I like them all. I like, the, I like the dark purple ones that you sent up here, AJ. They were good. We had the, uh, the more orange ones a couple nights ago. I, I went to Fred Meyer last week, and I found, I found sweet potatoes so big that I couldn't eat a whole sweet potato at a meal. It was just a huge. Anyway, yeah, I, I like potatoes. I like beans, too. I, you know I like to, I like to eat. I don't blame you. Let's see if there's any, I think those are all the ones that submitted. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat that we can ask uh, of you right now. Uh, you know, the, the fruit thing keeps coming up. You know, you talk about Dr. Kempner and he used fruit juice and sugar, but yet sometimes people think uh, that you don't want them to eat as much fruit. Well, I, I, yeah, you know, the Kempner diet, as I've described for you, is the diet for the desperate, the diet for the nearly dead. And I offer you that as an extreme, not that I would expect you to follow it, but I just want you to know about it for a couple of reasons. One, so you can see how powerful dietary therapy is. If you look at Walter Kempner's work, I start talking about it in my December 2013 newsletter, and I have all of his original papers for free for you thousand pages are up on my website of Kempner's work. 
you know, he takes care of people who uh, you know, have lost all but 10% of their kidneys, all but 10% of their heart. And he restores their health on the kind of diet that I'm telling you about, white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugar. But that's to show you, you know, I'm trying to show you where you could go as far as how this kind of thinking could take you and still be safe and effective. And, uh, you know, we went through various stages like the basic McDougal diet, trimmed it up a little bit for the fat vegan and those who want to have maximum weight loss, help those who are losing too much weight by adding back the things that you take off to help you lose weight and then take you to the extreme, which is Kempner's work. Kempner's work is powerful. It's uncontested. It is true. And you know, you have, you mentioned some of the, uh, the new, new diet doctors who are recommending this health food oil or that health food oil or making other comments about, you know, about the, uh, the doctors of the past. Excuse me, unless you understand the work of Walter Kempner and the worth of Nathan, work of Nathan Pritikin, I don't even want to give you the time of day. You don't deserve the time of day. You know, because you're looking at you're looking at research that's published well beyond what these pioneers published, and uh, it's you know it, sometimes they get off track and distorted in what they have to say. But the, you need to learn the basic science first. Yeah, provided it for you. It's on my website. It's free. I got 500 pages of Nathan Pritikin's original research, which was almost lost forever. But I happen to have it transferred to a digital copy, it's on the website. Same thing with Walter Kempner's work. I've got a, two volumes that you can have for free. And it was almost lost to almost lost to time because nobody appreciated the real value of these pioneers, which I have. Does he have any descendants? Uh, well, Pritikin has lots of descendants. You know, in fact, one of his, uh, his sons, Robert Pritikin and I, actually I got him interested in windsurfing. And he's a surfer, a very interesting guy. Tried to work in his dad's business for a while, but you know he, he had his own calling. And he has a, a brother who I know a little bit, but Walter Kempner never married. Uh, if you read, if you wanna read a little bit of Walter Kempner, and you might wanna look at my December, 2013 newsletter because a couple of his mentors talk about him. Uh, Robert Rosati and Frank Nealon worked for Kempner for 30 years. And they give some interviews about Walter Kempner, who he was, what he was like, and so on. It's really an interesting man. And of course, he, he lived on, on, you know, on the edge of excitement and disaster. So he wasn't perfect. Well, speaking of Kempner, Sylvan says, do you agree with his weight chart? Yeah, I, I do. I, uh, for one reason. One is if you find yourself losing too much weight, then that should reassure you that you're not. Mary and I both way below the Kempner recommendations. But you know, I, I had to think that for me to weigh what, what Walter Kempner recommends I should weigh would be okay. But we just happen to weigh a little less than that. So uh, yeah, I, I, I want you to look at that. I don't want you to look at it as a, as a desirable weight where you, where you wanna go as your goal. I just want you to look at it and understand that you're not too thin. Even when those around you are calling you too thin are people who knew you as an overweight person, as a rotund person, or any one of those other adjectives that I gave you in the beginning. They, they, they're not comfortable with the way you look now, but people who meet you new, I say, hey, you look, you look really good. You look healthy. You look trim. Yeah. Anyway, that's why the chart's there. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that probably all of my staff fits the weight of Walter Kepner's charts. Mary and I both do. Wow, I, I don't I don't quite make it almost. But you know, it's funny, Dr. Goldhammer once said to me that the people that call the people too thin are never as thin as them. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. You know, so the nice thing is you can always just add more nuts and seeds and avocados and gain weight. You know, you, you can do that. You you have once you understand the principles, it's a matter of just balancing, never being hungry. You can't be hungry, it doesn't work. You can't be sick all the time. It doesn't work. Once you balance the starch versus the non-starchy vegetables and you know you push the fats in the forms of nuts, seeds, and avocados, you're in control. You can look however you want to look. You want to be 50 pounds overweight? I can make you 50 pounds overweight. I could do that. 
I understand the food. I feed you avocados, which are 90% fat, nuts and seeds, which are 90% fat. I could do it. You know, it's not hard. You know, it's not hard. You've done it so many times yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Laura says, is there a place for nuts and seeds? And Eric says, unless you are overweight, do whole food plant fats like nut seeds, avocado, tofu, raise insulin resistance with a high starch diet or are plant fats safe in high amounts if somebody isn't overweight? No, I, 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 as far, I have to work on the principle that they're not, I, I know as free oils that they, you know, they cause sludging of the blood, they uh, cause, uh, they cause uh, you to require more insulin create insulin resistance. I know that from the study on free oils, uh, I'm pretty sure that you'll see the same thing by eating nuts and seeds and avocados if you do to a large extent. But uh, the studies, for example, there's one on my diabetic lecture I gave you a couple of months ago. <clears throat> there's a study of uh, type two diabetics where they gave them fish oil supplements and they increased their blood sugars like 34 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, in, this, in a similar study, uh, or a study that I quote in the same slide, I talk about type one diabetics who are given supplemental oil and they increase their need of insulin overnight by recreating insulin resistance due to this vegetable oil. But I haven't done the studies. And just like I haven't done the studies on sludging of the blood, if you were to eat nuts and seeds and avocados, maybe I should do that. You know, I'm actually thinking of it. I'm actually thinking of taking some more research money and and doing studies of sludging of the blood and doing studies of, uh, of plant fats. Yeah, I, I would love to see that actually, because uh, it's just always such a, a point of contention between vegans, you know, about how much fat we're supposed to eat. Do you, do you want to go on for a little bit more? If you do, I have Mary come over here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I never like to say goodbye. Well, let, let, me, let me, let me, and then I want to show you a little bit about the website. So let me have you talk to Mary for just a minute. Yeah. Hey, Esther, while he's getting her, you want to come back on for a second? Just, just so it's not just me. I see that you're still in the waiting room, Esther. You've been watching. What did you think of Dr. McDougall's talk? You have to unmute yourself, though, if you're going to talk. There we go. All right. Well, okay. so yeah, what you think? What'd it you was think wonderful. Of it was wonderful. I loved his uh, presentation. I loved the pictures of the people. I thought back, I had just posted a picture of my grandparents back in you know, early 1900s and they too were slim. And uh, later they did get, well, my grandmother got a little bit heavier, but not too much. But I've been just sitting here enjoying it and eating my potatoes. I'm on my fifth one. Nice. Just enjoying the potatoes. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful to hear him talk and to Really, he's so organized in all the presentations, all the graphics. I know. I love his presentations. Well, yeah. Hey, is Mary McDougall in the house now? I am here. How are you? I'm good. Good. <laughs> nice. How nice. are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, it's good so to see you, too. What, you just finished a program, didn't you? Um, about a week ago, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you enjoy that? I do. I do. We have these great... Um, I don't know, John calls them fireside chats, but they're uh, morning meetups. So every morning at eight o'clock, we get together on Zoom with all the people in the program. And uh, it's just their time to talk to us, ask us questions. And we talk about food and we talk about their, the problems they might be having. Um, although each of them has their own special support specialist to ask questions of, this is their time alone with us for every day that they're in the program. Yeah, I bet that's probably some of the most popular yeah, times. Yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. Yeah, that's good. Um, somebody's saying they may, your golden gravy probably, it must be one of your most popular recipes because everybody's mentioning it. I'm probably going to have that tonight. I'm probably going to make mashed potatoes with golden gravy. And I, I have some, um, probably some snap beans in the refrigerator. I think I need to use up or some cauliflower and broccoli and we'll have that with it. What, when's the last time you actually created new recipes? Cause you, you have like 4,000. I'm not that you need to do anymore, but do you remember when you kind of figured, you know, I've written enough books. This is enough recipes. You know, um, it's really funny because um, there's so many recipes now that are vegan and um, 
no fat and you know hardly any salt or sugar that I I really don't feel like I need to create anymore because there's so many out there. And I look um, through magazines and things like that and I always find something different, but it always um, sort of goes back to something I've already made before. And so- You're kind of like the mother of low fat cooking in a way. I mean, you're really kind of, I think if there were people before you, I sure don't know who they were that were- I, I don't either. I don't either. I think probably I, started it because there wasn't anything else out there well that's pretty impressive you should get some kind of award for that because that's that's amazing i'm curious what was your process back then did you just try to take recipes you already enjoyed and just try to make them first vegan and then vegan and low fat i did i did i took recipes that that john and i really like to eat and i just took the oil out or the butter or, or something else and i um, you know, learned how to make vegetable broth instead of using chicken broth. And um, I used um, vegetables or tofu. Let me move a little bit okay. in place of um, in place of the, the meats that I used to use. And so um, that's how it started out. And you then um, we had friends when we lived in Hawaii that had... Um, one of the first health food stores in, in um, Kailua, Hawaii, where we lived. It was called Earthseed. And it was filled with bins, just bins of um, beans and grains and flakes and all these things that I had, didn't know what they were. And so I just bought things and put them in bags and I experimented with them um, and came up with new things that way. Do you think Dr. McDougall would have been successful if it wasn't for you? No. Yeah. I could, you know, I, I, I would have been, I would have been like my mentors. Uh, my mentors being uh, Roy Swank, Nathan Pritikin, Walter Kepner, and um, this guy from Africa. Oh. Fiber man. <laughs> Dennis Burkett, Dr. Dennis Burkett. Yeah, Dennis Burkett. And, and I, I got to know these, these men pretty well. And I got to go through, you know, some of the trials and tribulations they had in providing good foods for their followers. And <clears throat> the one secret that I have that none of them had was, was Mary. You know, I knew their wives or, you know, some of their wives and, and they weren't oriented towards their husband's business and weren't oriented towards the kitchen. Uh, I, I remember one particular important night well, we had uh, Nathan and Eileen Pritikin over to, uh, to visit us in Hawaii. And we belonged to a yacht club, the Kaneo Yacht Club at that time. So we, we took over their facility and we had a potluck dinner there. And uh, we had about 250 people who followed us uh, at this particular yacht club pot, potluck dinner. And you know, Nathan Pritikin, he just, he said, boy, this is some of the tastiest food I've ever had. And uh, when we were walking out to the car, uh, Mary and I walked he and his wife out to their car. And, and uh, Mary said, you know, I'd like to give you something. I, I, I'd like to give you these recipes to use. And so he gave, uh, she gave him, Nathan Pritikin, 100 recipes. In his new book called The Pritikin Promise, the acknowledgments, uh, the first acknowledgments are to John and Mary McDougall. That's not right. They should be to Mary McDougall because the recipes in his book were Mary's. And the, the, food, the food for the Pritikin program, maybe it was a coincidence, I don't think so, dramatically improved as far as enjoyment and, and participant acceptance uh, after that particular evening. Now, Mary knows how to make the food taste good. She had to, she had to make a family uh, enjoy, enjoy this kind of eating. I remember another article that uh, was published in the, Honol or the San Francisco Chronicle. It would compare Dean Ornish's uh, cookbook to one that Mary put out at that time. And uh, Dean Ornish, it was described that his recipes were great if you were a professional chef in a professional kitchen. And Mary's recipes are described as homey, <laughs> you know, because this is real food. I mean, this is what we really eat. And it's not something you get in a fancy restaurant or you have to have somebody prepare all day long in a kitchen. It's just- Well, yeah, most people don't want to spend all day cooking their dinner for that night. 
Um, so, you know, I try and keep it simple. And there are some of my recipes that are more elaborate, um, which I still make, you know, when we're having guests over. But for John and myself, I try to keep it as simple as possible, things that are going to take me, you know, 15 to 20 minutes to prepare. And, um, Plus, about that long to eat. <laughs> Plus, you know, oh, I like the beans. I cooked beans like three nights ago. I, yeah. You know, if the beans, uh, for the first night I expected I'd have a bowl of beans with rice and, you know, we didn't have any tomatoes in the house, but, you know, well, maybe, we have avocados. Avocados, you know, a bowl of beans, a little sauce on it, or maybe I'd have slipped this uh, over a tortilla shell. That's what I expected the first night, but we didn't do that. <laughs> So instead, she went right to one of my favorites, which was the bean pizza. And then we had bean enchiladas last night when the oh. kids came over. We had, we, had, we had our son and his, his kids over last night for dinner. So anyway, the, the beans made it. My point being is that not only does Mary keep it simple, she makes sure that when she cooks one meal, you know, she at least has leftovers for lunch and maybe even two or three days worth of leftovers. Like I'm going to probably have you're going to have bean enchiladas for lunch. Yeah, I might have it. I was going to say Because all the rest of the beans are gone. How about, how about the pizza? Them. The pizza. Oh, there's some pizza left. All yes. Right. I like that. Anyway. Well, uh, well, tonight I think we're going to have mashed potatoes in. That's good. And creamy golden gravy. One of my favorites. Yeah. Well, a week from today is Valentine's Day, and people are wondering, Mary, if you have a special meal plan for your Valentine. I don't. I don't. <laughs> you know, Every um, day special, AJ. I'm just asking the questions. Uh, we we, uh, we used to celebrate Valentine's Day, but I it's guess been not. a long time. It, we are, it's not one of the. Uh, we had our fiftieth wedding anniversary a few weeks ago, and that was you know a bigger deal than Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah. did you make? Did you go out, or did you make a special meal? No, we we, um, we went to Craig's house. Oh, and, um, Mika made dinner. We had lasagna. That's amazing. 50 years. How did you put up with him? <laughs> I've, I've told you this before. It's only because of Mary. And I, those of you who know me, just like with you and Charles, I, I, I mean, I know if the same kind of relationship goes on or similar in the opposite direction, if it wasn't for Charles' patience, for his tolerance, for his forgive, forgiveness, <laughs> you and I have been kicked out of our homes a long time ago, AJ. <laughs> True. <laughs> yep. You got it. That's hilarious. So, so I married a happy person. And that was, that was one of the big things. And I fell in love. I fell desperately in love. Never happened to me before. You know, it's only happened to me once. So it was okay. That's why I hear it's supposed to happen. <laughs> Nice. So here's a question from Linda, who's watching live. Does the McDougal diet, can it prevent or reverse skin cancer? You know, actually, there's, there's an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was on the use of a low-fat diet to help with actinic keratosis, basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. So you'll look, you'll find this. Uh, and uh, I, know, I know you can find it. If you can't, just write me and I'll find it for you. It's uh, you just write, put in New England Journal of Medicine, put in low fat diet and put in actinic keratoses, which are precancerous lesions. And what they found is in the group that fed, at the, ate the low fat diet, they like had one sixth the amount of recurrences or, or half the amount of recurrences or, you know, somewhere in that range, depending upon the group you looked at. So yeah, they can make a big difference as far as uh, precancerous actinic keratosis changes. And I, I believe they also addressed uh, squamous and basal cell, but it's been a while since I've looked at the article. It's easy to find. Nice. So you're going to love this question because you, you, you really like salt and people are asking about it. I just wanted to tell you, I, I found this product and it is, has sodium, but it's made out of a vegetable. If you want, I'll get the guy to send you some. So it, it, it has in one quarter teaspoon, 135 milligrams, but it's made out of sea asparagus and it actually tastes exactly like salt, maybe even better. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. I'll get the guy to send me some. I'd love to try it. Yeah, it, it's green in color, but it, it really tastes just like salt. So I'm going get, to get you some. But I know you 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 like salt, Dr. McDougall. AJ, if it, if He's it, if changed, it, though. He doesn't like it. If it looks like, like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. <laughs> <laughs> it 
It, I, I think that what you got in the bag is salt. It's a seaweed salt. It is salt, but it's lower sodium than salt. You're right. It is. So it's it's not. If they're not like trying to pretend to be no salt, but it is. It's it's about fifty percent less sodium. So ostensibly, somebody would use less because. Well, plus so there, there are other from seaweed. There are other minerals that in that concoction too. You know, the tongue tastes minerals. It doesn't taste necessarily table salt, sodium chloride. It tastes minerals of many different varieties. So in, in a product that had other kinds of minerals, you know, they're gonna have potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, et cetera, et cetera. In a product like that, that has different minerals, you would uh, you'd naturally reduce the soap. Yeah, it does. It has a lot of magnesium, actually, it says so. Yeah, well, there's a uh, article that I'm, <clears throat> A lecture that I'm going to give sometime in the future is about how to treat high blood pressure if you're my patient. And uh, it, actually, the, it's reducing there's there's an argument that reducing the sodium doesn't make much difference. That the real difference in blood pressure comes from reducing the chloride. Anyway, this is an argument that went up in the fires five years ago that I'll have to look <laughs> up again. That's nice. Let's see what else we've got. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that wasn't in your PowerPoint was alcohol. Does that affect weight loss? It does. Uh, serious drinkers, if you know them, I mean, alcoholics are still thin. Okay. I mean, think about it for a minute. They're really, really thin. They're, they're malnourished too. Casual drinkers, moderate drinkers, sensible drinkers, reasonable drinkers. I'm not an alcoholic <laughs> drinker, but pretty close. <laughs> Those kind of drinkers, what happens is uh, the body prefers to burn alcohol over fat. So it'll use the alcohol molecule to supply the energy of the cell and leave the fat in the fat cell. The body will not convert alcohol into fat. It's just too expensive. Just like I showed you that the body doesn't convert sugar into fat. The body does not convert alcohol into fat either, but it will spare the fat because it prefers to burn sugar and alcohol over body fat, just leaves the fat in there. The other thing, uh, you know, this, this is a lot of calories, uh, alcohol, the calories do count. But the main thing is that it has to do with what causes us to do our behavior. You know, instead of just eating one potato chip, we eat two bags. And, uh, you know, you, you, of course, got to have a burger along with a beer. <laughs> I don't know. But if you were just going to drink and it wouldn't, wouldn't result in some, some indiscriminate abusive behavior, then you'd probably be okay. Nice. Mary Lou says, does a high fat diet increase skin cancer? Or I would wonder any cancer. Well, I just told you about the experiment done in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, yeah, it does. Uh, I would have to look at other research done, but I mean, that one article will tell you that a high fat diet promotes the re recurrence of actinic keratosis, which are precancerous lesions. So it's just like, it's just like in, in smokers. If you look at smokers from Japan, the male smoker, 60% of the males in Japan smoke. The male smoker has one fourth the chance of getting lung cancer as the American smoker, same number of cigarettes smoked. Why? Because the Japanese smoker eats a diet that is relatively low in fat, low in animals, high in carbohydrates, rice. So you smoke, you damage the lungs, uh, the body defends and repairs based upon its own strengths. And that depends upon what you eat. So you should figure naturally, even though smoking causes lung cancer, the diet have, would have a big influence on whether you would get it or not and how fast it would progress. Same thing with, with skin cancer. Uh, yeah, diet, diet affects everything. It has to, it's your food, it's your fuel. <laughs> yeah, people are saying, is it okay to put things on your skin or is that, will it get absorbed, the fat, the oils? The oils absorbed on your skin, yeah. <laughs> we, we had to, in fact, there's a, a lecture that I'm gonna give someday on fats and oils, but it talks about how, <clears throat> When I first started in medicine, we didn't have a way to, to give fat by intravenous. We could give sugar and protein by, you know, an IV bottle. You couldn't give fat. And so what we would do is we'd take and we'd smear uh, safflower oil on the patient's skin. And just that little fat distributed over an area of the skin. 
supplied all the essential fatty acid needs that the patient had. And that's how we delivered fat. You mean if they couldn't eat? Yeah, they could, you could, you know, their intestines didn't work. And so they had to be on IV alimentation. I guess I left that part out. <clears throat> but anyway, that's, that's why they were in the hospitals because their intestine didn't work. Say so they had extensive Crohn's disease or, you know, they'd had, I don't know, some kind of injury, car accident or something, their bowel was damaged. You, and they, you couldn't put food through the intestinal tract. We used to feed them IV intravenous feedings, but you couldn't give fat by the intravenous feedings back then. So we had to give it through the skin. That's interesting. Well, I, I know the answer to this. What does Mary eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? I know it's oatmeal for breakfast and Dr. McDougal makes it. And I think you put blueberries on it. And then lunch is leftovers from the night before and dinner, are all the wonderful things you've been mentioning. Yeah, that's right. I keep it really simple. Yeah, you, 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 I can't emphasize that enough. <laughs> it's the simpler you make this, you know, the more monotonous you make this, the better it will go in your life. You won't have to think about what you're going to mix, make. You know, you're shopping. Fried rice dishes. Yeah. So I make, you know, I make brown rice and um, frozen vegetable mix. And um, I found this really great um, fat free teriyaki sauce. And we add that to it. And what else do I put in it? Rice, vegetables. It's really good. Um, oh, baked, baked tofu squares. Well, that's just recently. That's new. Doing, she's been spoiling me lately. <laughs> we used to leave the tofu in the refrigerator for months. <laughs> but recently, recently, we've discovered that if we, if we utilize it, we cut it up and make little tiny squares out of it and put it in some soy sauce. It's a marinade of soy sauce yeah. and rice vinegar. It goes really nice with and, the dish. And um, agave. Ooh, and yeah. I mean, you just uh, bake it in the oven until the yeah. squares get kind of crispy and all the liquid is absorbed. And, you know, there's actually a recipe for that, um, I believe online and in the, um, the app cookbook, but, there's one in the, the last book we did, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. That was your that was your the, your last book, right, Mary? Yeah. That's probably the last book we'll ever do. I'm done. I'm done writing books. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, I did I did uh, I, 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 if you'd like, I, I'll just take a minute and introduce you to the website. Oh please. Oh, well, I, I might be do I might be doing some new recipes for the website now and then. So. Um, We'll keep, I'll keep thinking about it, you know. All right, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the website comes out, it was supposed to be launched today, but unfortunately it's gonna be a couple more days. But uh, not that I'm comparing our work to Albert Einstein, but it's kind of interesting that a hundred years has passed and still we have the same plea and that is to save our planet with a good diet. Now, Albert Einstein said uh, nothing will benefit human health or increase chances for survival of life on earth. I mean, how did he know 100 years ago as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet? And one of the statements that I make in this website is diet is the most powerful and the most neglected tool we have for mitigating climate change. Anyway, uh, this is, the, this is some, some of the pages from the website and I'll let you know, hopefully this week it'll be launched but here are some of the pages. And we'll put an announcement out. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll put an announcement. Uh, I don't know what happened. Do you see anything, AJ? I know, I just see black, Dr. McDougall. Well, me too, I better get this again. You could tell us if you can't get it to work. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Let's see. You know what? I know what I need to do. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Okay. So anyway, there's some of the pages. Uh, there's a short introduction that Mary and I do to get people's attention. And it starts out, we're going to redo this video. It starts out with a video that asks, is there something one person can do, you know, besides uh, driving a hybrid or electric car and recycling. What's, is there one, one, one thing a, a person could do that'll make a difference? And Mary and I, of course, come back and tell you, yes, you know, you can 
reduce your output of global warming gases by 80% overnight. And that half the, half the greenhouse gases are due to the agricultural industry, animal agriculture. And then this website talks about four dietary deceptions, four deadly dietary deceptions that not only have been killing people, but are killing our planet. And that's the belief that we need to have protein and calcium as primary nutrients in our diet. We don't need this emphasis. This is just to sell meat and dairy products. And then it discusses fish oil too, another deadly dietary deception. And those are all really negative things that occur as a consequence of bad food choices. And the other deception is the idea that, that starches somehow are bad foods. They've been maligned by so many people. So the four dietary deceptions are discussed there. In this particular website, I talk about not a vegan diet, not the McDougall diet, even though I, I have to tell you, as I've worked through this project, I, ha I have to say that you know, there's no other diet there that will reach the goals of planet saving more than what we put together over the last 50 years. Every other diet has some kind of compromise that I object to, like add a little seafood or et cetera. So anyway, what I decided to do, instead of calling the McDougall diet or the vegan diet, I've decided to call it a traditional diet. Just like I presented for you in this lecture, I showed you that these are diets of everybody, everybody who's walked this earth, except for a few crazies over the last 50 <laughs> to 100 years. And then we offer a free program, uh, which is based on, of course, the original website. And there are a bunch of lectures that I've done and uh, I'll be doing more. I, just recently I did a lecture with uh, Dan Butner, the Blue Zone guy and with Dean Ornish. And I'll be doing a whole bunch of other experts. But one thing this tone of this website is going to have is a tone of optimism. There are so many people out there saying that we're in huge trouble, but they don't offer us any solutions on getting out of trouble except for the obvious, you know, take care of big oil, et cetera. This whole website is dedicated to what we can do. I, I can't give up. You know, I'm not, gonna, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna sit back and say, we're done. You know, the planet's in big trouble, but we still aren't done. I still have some fight in me and so do you. And uh, experts around the world who are really studying this issue, they, they've clearly said, you know, taking care of the fossil fuel problems are not going to do it for us. We're too far beyond that. We have to fix the food. We have to fix the diet of the entire planet. So there are people besides me who know this. The question is, is will the population of planet Earth listen to us? Well, this is why I put this website up. It's taken us a year to develop it. Is I, I, it's a way of me sticking my hand up above the crowd and saying, look at me. Look at, look at what we have. We have the kind of approach that we need to get the planet healthy again. Who knows? You know, it was just a year of my time and small amount of investment from our foundation. But if we get noticed, wow, wouldn't that be something? Anyway, I think you'll like to come and visit this website uh, on occasion. Uh, it's certainly gonna appreciate your support but the whole goal is going to be to bring an optimistic point of view as far as saving ourselves. And I'll leave it to the other guys to tell you how much trouble we're in. Well, who's gonna fill your shoes? Oh, so I'm not going any place. Oh, good, that's good. Hey, people are asking what annual exams you both get. None. Oh, none. <laughs> Not even dental? You don't even go to the dentist? Oh, the dentist, yeah. Well, we have, I don't know. We have our teeth clean. Oh, we have our teeth clean, yeah. We have, uh, you know. Uh, but we uh, don't have x-rays every time we go to the dentist. No. There's, a, there's a whole article I did under working with MDs. It's on the website under hot topics. And it talks to you about the annual physical examination and how every, every organization, including the American Medical Association, recommends against getting an annual physical. Because all you're doing is you're finding problems that would have never troubled the person. You're costing the person money, you're sending them off to further tests and treatments they never would have needed. You do more harm than good by these annual exams. And that's why every organization that I'm aware of has told the general public not to get an annual physical examination. 
Now, what you should have checked is you should have your hearing, your sight, your teeth checked when you get into your older years to see how they're doing. And maybe to have a little help in those areas like glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, pap smears, I recommend pap smears in sexually active women between the ages of say 28 and 50. And I explained to you why and uh, well, no, maybe I need to give you a lecture on early detection tests. And uh, I also recommend one colon exam around age 60, just one, either a sigmoid exam or a series of uh, stool tests for blood or genetic material. I don't recommend sigmoid, I don't recommend uh, uh, colonoscopies, too dangerous. And let's see, anything else? You don't recommend mammograms? No, no, I'd stay away from PSA testing, mammograms. What do you say, Dr. McDougall, to the person, you know, because I don't, I don't get any of that, but I don't tell other people what to do because they have a right to do what they want. But the person that didn't get the mammogram and then got cancer and then gets upset because they listened to the doctors that said, don't get them. Well, you know, you, of course, want to believe that you're going to be saved. You know, in, in studies, uh, like the Cochrane collaboration and the studies that they did, <clears throat> they, they said that out of 2,000 women screened, one of them would have her life saved, but 10 would have their lives destroyed because of overdiagnosis that had never come down with cancer. And 200 would have to go for further testing and treatment. So more harm than good is done. Uh, that doesn't reassure the person who says, yeah, but I, I'm the one in 10,000 that it saved. Well, yeah, okay, you can look at it that way, but looking at it from a general health point of view, I don't think this is well spent money. How about if we took all that money, which is you know, twenty billion dollars a year at least, on just the mammograms, not not the the follow up business of further testing and treatment, just for mammograms. What if we took that twenty billion dollars and when we put on morning cartoons for the kids, teaching them how to eat, or you know, regulating industry so that they can't put out foods like I just showed you in this presentation without a serious, serious warning from the Surgeon General. I mean, to, to sell you things that have 1,200, 1,300 calories a meal, half fat in a meal, that should have a warning, I would think. Anyway, we, we, we could better spend our money, uh, uh, AJ, if we were really interested in the health of people, but for a whole bunch of reasons, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, Cheryl wants to know, have you ever talked to Senator Cory Booker or now the New York City Mayor, Eric Adams? No, I sure would like to, though. I sure would like to. I mean, you know, Mayor Adams, of course, he's a fellow who was very, very sick with Western diseases. And he got better because he was influenced by the kind of thinking that we try and teach you. I think uh, it was Neil Bernard and Esselstyn that got to him. And uh, yeah, but occasionally there's a blip out there amongst all this craziness. You know, like Bill Clinton saved himself from heart disease. That was good. And now we have, uh, we have Adams who saved himself from diabetes. Very, very sick man. So he'll stand up there in the crowd for a while, but how long? You know, when, when is it going to be enough that people are gonna make serious changes? So far, I have to tell you, I've been disappointed. Uh, when I discovered this, I told you back in 1977, 1976, now I thought I'd be the most popular doctor in the world. I mean, I know how to cure heart disease and diabetes. Believe me, you know, there's, there's, not, there's not a huge line outside my office door still, but uh, it's becoming better and more and more people are listening. You know, it's word of mouth. You, you get better and you tell your friends and relatives that they have the same option. All they have to do is change what they eat. And here it's free on this website, or you can buy this book for 50 cents at the store, or you could come to our uh, our 12 day program and we'll help you through it. We will help you through it. We'll get you off the drugs, get your health back, get your learning and liking the food. We'll do that. We're real good. We've been doing this for, all, for more than 44 years. We've been doing this. So. People want to know where they can get the bean pizza recipe. Oh, um, actually, I don't think there is one. <laughs> um, 
Do I have a beer? Yeah, there must be. Will you buy the pizza crust? Yeah. You look for a pizza crust that's already pre-made. Um, there are several brands out there that are... are um, Do you want me to try and get some other cover? No, there aren't any in there. Oh, okay. We have to buy some new ones. Um, or you can make your own pizza crust. We have recipes in, online for making your own pizza crust, which is really easy. Um, and then I just spread uh, refried beans that I make, which are not refried, of course. They're just mashed pinto beans. Over cook, the top, cooked in, slow cook. cook, cook, cook in my slow cooker. But you could cook them on the stove or in an instant pot. Mm -hmm. um, or you could use canned beans, or you could use the um, Santa Fe bean flakes that are fat free, already mashed beans. That's simple. That's yeah. really, really stu simple to make. And um, you just mix the bean flakes with water, and you have refried beans that are fat free. And uh, you can season them the way you like to, but I just keep them plain, and then I put um, a can of um, roasted um, dice green pep, um, jalapenos on the top of it and some black olives and um, some salsa. Tomatoes. Well, I don't do that till after that. And I put it in the oven and bake it. And then when it comes out of the oven, I add shredded lettuce and some avocado and tomatoes. That and sounds the, delicious. And hot sauce. And I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's one really of the best easy. pizzas you ever had, too. That sounds I, amazing. I, I love my food. <laughs> well, you couldn't have done it this long if you didn't, I don't think. It's, you know, it's, not a, it's not about suffering. I, and I think most people, even those that are, are heavy, heavy into the Western diet, can see yeah. that they get great enjoyment out of certain things that we recommend. And that's the things you need to keep in your diet. You may be a rice lover or a potato lover or a bread lover or a pasta lover. You, know, you like some of these foods. I, I, I don't believe they've perverted your taste so much. Maybe they have that you don't even recognize what food tastes like. Maybe that's- the Well, I have recipes that, that are based on, you know, traditional foods like lasagna and, um, you know, I have the tofu tacos that I make that are based off of a fish taco and um, uh, macaroni and cheese that I make with the, um, the potato cheese type dressing or sauce. And so there's a lot of recipes that are familiar. Um, and um, you, so you just look for those things that you already like and you make the healthy version and that becomes your new favorite. Yeah, I've never heard this question been asked before, Dr. McDougall. People are asking about your foundation. Can you talk about it and the work of it? Well, it was, we established it in 2003. And uh, we've been doing, it's a 501c3. And we've done, well, you know, some pretty interesting work. We did uh, a study at OHSU out of the foundation. Uh, we also did our in-house study out of the foundation. Uh, we've donated uh, a few dollars here and there, like to Dr. Clapper and his movement of educating people across the country back when he was doing that. And we also uh, had a program where we uh, paid for the travel and housing expenses for medical students from any place in the world that they wanted to come and train with us. Now that has, and, uh, we've not restarted that, even though I've restarted my association with the medical school or one that I work with pretty closely. <clears throat> uh, but so far we've not been able to build in a uh, medical training program with the telemedicine option. I don't, I don't know why, because to me, this is what young doctors ought to be learning is telemedicine. And that's the kind of practice that I think they ought to be building for themselves. It's much better than having to go to an office or a hospital every day. But anyway, we, we will be taking more students. So we educate students, we educate the public, we do some scientific research. And now this new project is, is that we're educating the public about the importance of diet and saving the planet. The planet is our new patient. So hopefully you'll all jump on board and say, this is really worthwhile. And I'm afraid that if you don't, you will learn that it is worthwhile as time goes on. I hate to say it, but it's, uh, climate change is gonna become more relevant every, every day, every week, every month.
that we continue on the course that we're on. I'm not going to give up. You know, we can make a difference. Even if it seems overwhelming, if there's just one chance in a billion that we could help, I'm going to try. Wouldn't you? I bet you would. Uh, people want to know if you both exercise on a daily basis. We walk. That's about all we do. Every day. <laughs> Every day we walk. You want to um, see? You want to see my exercise bike? <laughs> We got yeah. one over here in the corner. <laughs> That's for the days we don't walk. Yeah. But usually we like to walk. We have a really great park and a wonderful walkway just outside yeah. our condo. And so we go for a, a, really about a mile every day. And then really the summer, nice walk. In the summer, we do more. Yeah, it's a couple of miles every day. More walking. Explore the city. Nice. That's great. Let's see. Oh, I don't know why Judy wants to know if you're O positive or O negative, Dr. McDougall. So you're you're the universal donor, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So you can give to everybody. That's what they say. Yeah. And I've given blood before. I, you know, I've unfortunately I've received blood before too. <laughs> Mary, do you know your blood type? A. A. Cool. You, you probably have little feet. You should be eating rice. <laughs> I, should be eating rice. I, I should be eating meat. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> That's the foot and mouth diet. That is hilarious. I love that. Let's see if there's any other questions. Just a lot of nice comments for you guys. Oh, well, we know the end. I know the end. I could almost tell a lot of these stories, but how did you two meet? It, I think I remember, wasn't it in an operating room and all you could see was her eyes? Yeah. No. Yeah, I was, I was uh, working on pinning a hip, which, you know, was on the orthopedic service. So of course, when I say I was working on it, I probably was holding a retractor. <laughs> I was a medical student and uh, Mary was our surgical nurse. And uh, yeah, I don't know what hit me, but I haven't recovered since that day. <laughs> and yeah, we met in an operating room. It took me three weeks to get a date. She wouldn't go out with me. Finally, she relented. <laughs> Why wouldn't you at first, Mary? I mean, he was obviously very good looking. He showed a picture oh, of with yeah. a cat. Actually, I had a different boyfriend at the time. She had a social calendar that didn't fit. And uh, so I was um, a little hesitant. And then finally I decided, well, I really didn't, didn't see a future with this other guy. You know, it wasn't my one true love. So I decided to go out with him and then um, broke, broke the news to my other boyfriend and um, stay with John for the rest of my life. Do you know what happened to him by any chance? No, I don't. I don't. Oh, you know, there were so many boyfriends in the past. She can't remember <laughs> them all. That's a problem. I don't remember she, his name, she, but that's about it. <laughs> she, she had, a, she had a, a full social calendar. I was, I was busy working, learning how to be a doctor, nose to the grindstone, you know, and she was out there having fun. Okay. Here, here. This is a fun part of my life. That's that's what was important. <laughs> this is a fun question from Gloria. When you guys are out walking, do you tell anybody um, if they're eating badly? No, no, no. We we sometimes make, tempted. <laughs> we sometimes make comments, particularly if it's a child. You know, or, or it, it, you can see the pain that comes. Uh, you know, some people. Well, we don't make comments. No, to the, just to ourselves. Just to ourselves. We don't make comments make to comments the mother to or the child. I, I, I am tempted at times, and, uh, but I, I've learned not to do that. Well, we do talk amongst ourselves yeah. about the people we it's, see, it's, because everywhere you go, that's what you see. Yeah, it's just really, really sad to see so many overweight, sickly people. Although I have to admit here in Portland, we have this great running track around the park that's in front of our condo. And so there are a lot of thin people here um, that, um, we don't see when we go into the grocery store or some of the other places here. But we do see a lot. We do meet a lot of thin people out walking. Nice. A uh, question from Diana. Will you ever join Heather on her Instagram lives? Well, probably not. Probably not. We're, <laughs> we're not I, go to, I go to Instagram once in a while, but I don't know what to do when I get there. And so um, it's just one of those things that you know, you know we're, we're this, <laughs> that age has passed. We're past that age. 
you know, for us, learning uh, the computer world was a big deal. Now all these other things, these Facebooks and Instagrams, and yeah, we really don't do anything. You know, the Twitters and this, this is way beyond. I know. Anything I really want to learn. I <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how to do Twitter. I agree with you. I wish I wish it would go away, and I wish there was. I just, I, of course, I'm I'm on social media, but I love YouTube. It's a little different, but the other ones. Hey, so Bridwana says, would you be interested if someone wanted to make a movie about your life? I would love to read both of your autobiographies. And Dr. McDougall, if there was a movie about your life, who would play you? Oh, well, I don't know. I don't either. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I have to tell you. It would be interesting. It would be, it would be very interesting. We, we've, had, we've had a very blessed life. i just put it that way. We've had great fortune. Uh, that don't mean in terms of gathering money, but we've had great fortune in so many ways, wonderful children. And we, we did everything that we wanted to do. We don't have to look back and say, I wish I would have. You know, there was a time when <clears throat> Mary's dad wanted me to pay off the house <laughs> and I wanted to buy an airplane. Well, I bought an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I finally got the house paid off, but you know, that took years, but if, uh, you know, that was the time in life when I felt like well, I wanted to fly an airplane. Married yeah, and when, our, and when our two oldest kids were younger, we had a big sailboat. Yeah. And we sailed between the Hawaiian Islands. So we didn't leave anything so. behind. Even if we had to go tremendously in debt, we did pretty much everything that we should have been doing at that time, traveling. You know, we started the adventure business. We traveled all over Central and South America in Hawaii. And so we had a chance to show our family a good share of the world. And yeah, so, you know, we, we, we would have an interesting story to tell you. Not all of it's, it's good either. There'd be a few chapters in there that you probably realize that we're just like you are. We've had some tough times too. I'm asking people in the chat who they think should play you guys. It's, it, uh, uh, I, I'm getting, I've never heard of an actor named Christopher Waltz, but people are saying Christopher Waltz, Leonardo DiCaprio, Richard Gere, Meryl Streep for Mary, Harrison Ford. Yeah, uh, you guys, are you also kind of. That would be amazing. Yeah, I, I vote for Meryl Streep. Why not? You may as well have the best, right? Uh, Marilyn says, what kind of oatmeal do you eat in the morning? Is it rolled oats, steel cut oats, oat groats, instant oats? Bob's Red Mill. I buy, buy it in the 40 pound bag. And then we scoop it out and keep it in a, um, yeah. a sealed container. That's how often we have oatmeal as I get the, I think it's 40 pounds or maybe it's 20. It was just a great big bag and you know, that lasts, huge, us yeah. for, lasts us for a couple of months, not that long. Nice. So we, then we buy two, two of those bags at a time. Yeah. Nice. We, we, buy, we buy a lot of food. Uh, that we eat all the time, we, we buy it from a from a, uh, a restaurant supply house because that way we don't have to carry so many things home from the grocery store. It helps that way, and it, we probably save a little money that way too. But we buy well, it helps in packaging too. You don't have to yeah, you don't waste, waste some, all those packages. So you might consider doing that. You might consider find some warehouse store. This is where we go to the one called Webstrand. Web, Webstrand. It's a pretty good store. Cool. Linda wants to know if you're going to be doing your McDougal Advanced Study Weekends anymore. Maybe. You know, we 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 all we, we have the desire, like everybody else, to get back to normal. And uh, we will never change the, the telemedicine program. I don't think we'll ever run a live-in program again. Just just too ineffective. <clears throat> but somehow getting together with people we really miss, and we used to gather together quite often 300 people from around the world that would get together with us in Santa Rosa, California. We'd invite a whole bunch of guests, speakers, and entertainment. And that was fun, but maybe even more fun would be to go on another adventure trip. <laughs> how, about if we, how about if we ran the ship, will you guys come? We used to do that. We used to put you know, $75,000, $100,000 on a ship and hope you showed up, and you did. <laughs> Luckily. But that was, you know, we, we've been risk takers, to say the least. Oh, I like this one. Clint Eastwood for you, Dr. McDougall. That's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. We, we actually had a chance to meet him at one of Dean Ornish's weddings. Wow. That's, that's cool. He's thin, too. I'll tell you, he's really thin. 
Yeah, but he's probably not vegan. I think he is, actually. I think he is? Oh, yeah. that's amazing. I would, you know, being good friends with Dean, I, I would find it, uh, you, I don't, I don't know for a fact that he is, but, you know, they're, they're good friends. And, and I thought, I would think Dean would have, as good as he looks, I mean, good grief, he's an older guy. He looks good. Yeah. Question if you were a smoker, but quit, can any of that damage be reversed? Well, tons of it has been. You know, I'm talking from personal experience. I have 20 pack years in me. So, you know, I... <clears throat> How do you I, count pack years? Pack years, well, I have 10 years, two packs a day. That's 20 pack years. Oh, okay. 20 pack years. So if I smoke 10 years, two packs a day, sometimes three. Let's take in my lungs. <laughs> see, see how much they can boost, they can survive. Do, do you guys ever test your body? I mean, really, have you ever tested it? I bet you have. It's tough. So yeah, yeah, we recover. Yeah, you know, the more damage, uh, the more permanent damage you have, the less your ability to recover. But the body is amazing, its ability to recover. Thank goodness. You could do the advanced study weekend online if you didn't want to do it in person. You think so? I, I, think I, don't, so. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe we've talked about it. Well, you did everything, you're doing everything else great what, online. What would, the, what would be the interest? I mean, how, how, how would you appeal to somebody to tune in? To, well, well, you'd have different guests. guests. Yeah, you'd get, get people like, get Cory Booker, you know, people that aren't maybe as yeah. easy to get. Well, that would be really nice if we could get people that, you know, Al Gore and Bill Clinton and Michelle Obama and Cory Booker. And Michelle Obama's vegan, by the way. I think her husband is too, but I wouldn't say it publicly. <laughs> you just did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to hurt his career. Yeah. But Michelle, I have a tape of her being on uh, Jay Leno's show, feeding Jay a vegan meal. You still have that? Oh, yeah. Huh. I'll show it sometime if you'd like. It was really interesting. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Well, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for the work you do and for never uh, retiring. We appreciate that. What are you going to do? Look for it? Uh, I, I find it. Mary, Dr. McDougall always talks about how he only sleeps like four or five hours a night. Do you, do you sleep a little bit longer? I, I sleep a little bit longer, yes. I sleep probably um, seven hours a night. Uh, I'll have to get it for you some other time. What do you do with all that extra time if you don't sleep? <laughs> he gets up and works. Yeah. He reads journals because everything's online these days, so he can read all of his journals online. Yeah. Oh, to, you know, mail all the journals just to come in the mail, and I'd have piles of journals sitting around the house, and now everything's online, so he can just in the morning just read journals. Wow. Uh, Chelsea says, is the McDougal diet good for pregnancy? Dr. McDougal wrote an entire book about that, a book about women's health, women's health. Right. My, my right. January 2011 newsletter. Did you hear that? January 2011 newsletter is about a pregnancy and um, the McDougal diet and how to feed yourself. Um, you get when, him I was, when I was pregnant with Craig, our last child, I gained um, 15 pounds. And when I left the hospital, I weighed less than I did before I got pregnant. And um, my car was littered with rice cakes. I ate rice cakes all the time when I was hungry. There, were, there weren't that many um, vegan snacks or e things easy to carry around, um, you know, 39 years ago. And so I had rice cakes rice cakes all the time and my car and they when they when you eat them they crumble and so my car was always littered with rice cake crumbs that's funny that is funny it was a really easy pregnancy so that, the way dr mcdougall remember states maybe has he ever thought about going on jeopardy oh no he wouldn't he he's good at dates but he's not good at the trivia stuff uh, i'm good at things that i've written yeah. I can tell you where I can tell you where every period and paragraph is. 
Uh, can you influence hospitals to serve good food? Where do you start? Every time that questions come up, the doctors have said that hospitals get ratings. And if the patients don't like the food, they give them bad ratings. Well, I, I changed two hospitals. Both of them were Adventist hospitals. One was Castle in Kailua, Hawaii. The other was St. Helena in the Napa Valley. <clears throat> and we had actually a community support and they would serve a McDougal entree or two or three McDougal entrees, depending upon which, what time it was and you know, which cafeteria we're talking about. But it actually was quite popular. So the you know, Seventh-day Adventist hospitals are, they have a religion that promotes good health and vegetarian eating. And by the way, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I know nothing about their religion. I just happen to be a very acceptable doctor in their hospitals. So yeah, you, you could. I had, uh, you know, when I, when I first brought my program to St. Helena uh, and introduced the diet, you know, it was no fat, no oil, no dairy, no meat, <laughs> you know, and uh, pretty, pretty soon they had a meeting over my, my program and the diet that I served, and they wanted me to take all the spice and all the pepper out of the food, all, all the spices of all kinds, because Adventists don't believe in, you know, in spicy. And they wanted to take the vinegar or out. Vinegar, yeah. yeah, they don't believe in spoiled food or they're spicy. <clears throat> so they uh, came to me and they insisted that I take all the vinegar and all the spicing out of the food. And I said, I got nothing left. So we had a meeting and I explained to them that, uh, first of all, that you know, I got to make the food taste decent so we need to put a little salt and pepper and spice and vinegar, et cetera, on the food to make it, I've given up everything. And then what I did is I really fixed them. I said, you know what? I said, I can go up to the doctor's lounge here and I can find coffee in the doctor's lounge. That's against your religion. I said, I can go to the next cafeteria over to the employee's cafeteria and I can find Tabasco sauce, which is pepper and vinegar together that you serve to the employees. And I went down the line, by the time I got done, they gave up. But what happened was kind of interesting during the, during the next four programs, you couldn't eat the potatoes because of the amount of pepper they put in them. <laughs> they sure showed me. Anyway. Uh, well, the food at the Fl Flamingo oh, yeah. was much better when, when we did our live-in program at the Flamingo Hotel because they used my recipes. Yeah, Mary and Heather went in and taught them for 11 and months. So, yeah. But we, at the at Stanley, the hospital, you have to realize this is a hospital cafeteria, hospital kitchen. I even brought in professional chefs to try and get them to learn how to make the food right. You know, I paid for it. And it was always hospital food, no matter what you did to it, it was hospital food. Did, did any of them change? Like I know when, when you taught them that, did any of the chefs at the hospital, at the hotel, like change their diet because of what they learned? Oh yeah, we had a lot, a lot of the staff, you know, lost a hundred pounds. We, we used to parade the staff in almost every program and so-and-so that served them, you know, the meals had lost 60 pounds or hundred pounds, or had diabetes, yeah, it happened all the time. We, we, I even had doctors at St. Lena Hospital and Castle Hospital follow my program, even though they wouldn't recommend their patients to it. I, I, was, I was at St. Lena Hospital for 16 years. I, I got not a single referral from fellow doctors in 16 years. I took care of them. I took care of their spouses. I took care of their children. Somehow or another, they never found it worthwhile to send their patients to me. So, and, and I gave a couple of conferences where I explained all the benefits that we had to offer. And uh, each, each conference, I said, you know, it's rather unique that this is a community that doesn't have any dietary diseases. And do you know how I know that? You haven't referred me a single patient in 16 years. You can imagine how much fun I, I am at a conference. Are you, are you in touch with anyone you went to medical school with? Did they see what- We're having, our, we're having our 50th year reunion this year. 50 years. We're, we're meeting in East Lansing, Michigan, or at least those of us willing to travel are gonna meet there. Do, do any of them know what came of you? Yeah, some of them do, quite a few of them. We're, we're a real close school. We only had 28 students. And- uh, 
You were the first class, right? You were the first class at Michigan State. I think only because of Michigan State was I, uh, would, I, would I be a doctor today. If I had gone to a more traditional medical school, you know, one that had a reputation to defend and so on, they'd have thrown me out so fast. Uh, I, I, you know, you think I'm challenging today. I've been this way my whole life. You know, and the professors would say something I knew was wrong. You know, I wasn't politically correct when I pointed it out. And you're still not, which is why we love you. <laughs> I, I got in trouble. We, we, you know, it's, 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 that's just kind of my personality. Is I see a problem, I've got a, an answer for it that I think should be expressed, and I do it. It's just like when Mary and I first went to, uh, to Honoka on the Big Island of Hawaii, and we had our first two children at Honoka Hospital, where, you know, I was one of the very few doctors. And, and uh, when we saw what the, the situation was for the birthing and how terrible the women and the children and the families were treated, we got, we got things changed. Uh, the hospital I'm, I was at, Honoka Hospital, was the first hospital to allow husbands in the delivery room. And it was the first hospital that allowed the babies to be with the mothers after birth. They used to take the babies and stick them in a separate cold dreary room with no pictures and, and they all bring the babies to see the mothers at feeding time. That's the way they used to treat them. And I, I said, this has got to stop. And so we made it so the mothers would have their babies from the time of birth till the time they went home. The third thing I got changed was, was I got uh, women to go home right after their childbirth. In other words, it used to be a woman would have to stay, well, my mother used to stay a week after the birth of a child. But it was, you know, at least a couple of days at that time, and women wanted to go home. They said, we're, we're not sick. So, I, you know, I got, anyway, I, there was the first hospital to have husbands in the living room, to have, uh, to have the baby situation fixed, and to, have, uh, and to have women go home immediately after delivery, which is what Mary did after her deliveries. She said, I'm not sick. I just had a baby. Let's get out of here. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, it's terrible. They would, they would. <clears throat> they would worry about me. I said, I'm getting up. I'm going to go take a shower. And they'd stand by the shower door worried I was going to fall down or something. Yeah. And I'll say, oh, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, I'm fine. I'm just yeah. taking a shower and I'm going to go home. That's yeah. hilarious. For the, for the birth of Heather, we had to get clearance <sighs> from a pediatrician, from our obstetrician. Otherwise, they wouldn't let us go home. I don't know how they thought they were going to keep me, but... <laughs> But anyway, we finally went home with their permission about an hour or two after the delivery. Is... But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just my personality. It's not going to change. I'm, I'm going to be a real thorn wherever I think needs to be properly pricked. Nice. I suppose that's the right way to say it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've gotten this question before, but Eric says, Dr. McDougall, do you recommend some nuts alongside with salads or cruciferous vegetables to aid absorption? Not necessary. You know, the idea that you need to, uh, and I actually wrote about this, you can find it in on my website under hot topics, I think under, uh, under fats and oils, it's under the section about fats and oils under nutrition hot topics. And there's an article which, uh, which shows that uh, when you eat oil along with your tomatoes and avocados and so on, you absorb more nutrients. But it's not necessary because you sort all the nutrients you need without the oil. You know, once you've taken enough nutrients, how would more help you? Once you've, once you've filled all the requirements, how would more help you? You know, it's, it's like hey, taking a car that has, uh, has six cylinders, 12 spark plugs. Once you've filled up all the holes in the, in the cylinders with spark plugs, what, what is, what's 14 spark plugs gonna do for you? Or 22, put them on, put them on the dashboard, you know, throw them in the trunk. And once you've supplied all your needs, why do you need more? More is better, right? No, that's not the case. As people are always worried about deficiencies when the true cause of most disease is excess. Yeah, and again, that's one of those obvious things, that AJ, that people should be able to see is you have no friends with protein deficiency, no friends with calcium deficiency, no friends with scurvy, no friends with beriberi. You don't have any, you, don't get, you got pro problems, you got pro people, people close enough for you to touch who are dying of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, suffering with constipation, headaches, arthritis, right in front of you. 
you can, you, I've never seen any of the problems I just mentioned about in terms of deficiency disease. I've never seen protein deficiency. I've never seen scurvy. I've never seen beriberi. So Karen says, why do all the brain doctors recommend nuts and seeds and some even oils now? You can't use doctors as an excuse for recommending good nutrition. The average, the average number of hours spent in nutrition education in four years of medical school is three. In my medical school training, I got one hour of nutritional education. It was on how to choose between different infant formulas. You know, the joke goes that a, a, a secretary and a doctor know as much about nutrition unless the secretary happens to be on a diet, then she knows more. You know, it's just a joke. We've tried, we're taught biochemical formulas. Still to this day, there's no dietary therapy taught. In other words, what, what I practice, and in other words, fixing the food so I can help you get well, is not taught. You know, it's just, they know a little bit about the biochemistry, the pathways, et cetera. But as far as applying a bean to a kidney problem, they have no idea. Still to this day. Well, there are some doctors out there that are not well, money, Mary. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't. You know, who 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 practices this way? Maybe Neil Bernard. Yeah. Yeah, he's a practicing doctor. Uh, Clapper does. Yeah. But these are my friends. Well, there are some other ones that we've heard about. Ah, uh, not many. Not many. Yeah, a few. Well, if they are, they're rebels, and they don't always do it in the right way. Some of them are out there prescribing a bunch of health food olive oils, et cetera, and olive oils. Yeah. But you know, they rebelled against the standard. What I'm talking about is the standard education that goes on. Doctors know nothing about nutrition unless they are self-educated or in some way got exposed, but not through their medical training. 3% of the board questions had anything to do with nutrition. Dr. McDougall, where do you stand on things like Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger, and even lab-grown meat? Not interested. It's, it's a, first of all, it's not gonna solve the problem. You're never gonna, you're never gonna produce enough grown meat or plant-based meat to supply the calorie needs of the people on this planet. You can only do that with starch, potatoes, rice, corn, et cetera. So it's not gonna solve the problem. And plus, you know, it, it, it reaffirms that meat eating is normal and natural to tell you that if you're not gonna get the real dead animal, we're gonna make one that looks and tastes and smells just like the dead animal you're used to. So the dead animal must be proper nutrition. There's a problem here. But, but, but I look, at, okay, so I, I I look at it from a cruelty standpoint. And if people aren't going to stop eating meat, wouldn't it be better if there was lab grown meat than to keep torturing the animals the way we are? That's, that's the excuse, but it's not going to solve the problem. I'm, I'm interested in the big problems solving the, I'm not interested in, in fixing the dinner plate of some rich folk that can afford fake meat as opposed to, as opposed to real meat. Those are just for the privileged few, not for the masses. I'm interested in the masses. Yeah. Linda says, why do you think there aren't more doctors furthering their education by learning about plant-based nutrition? Because they can't make a living doing it. The, 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 the medical practice is based on a seven minute office visit that is, is, is consummated by the signing of a prescription pad. Next, that, that's, that's what the medical practice is based on, a general practice of medicine. You can't sit down and talk to your people, properly educate them in that kind of payment system. I get paid the same amount for a visit where I write you a prescription or the same amount for a visit where I spend three hours with you trying to teach you about good food. So we have to change the payment system for people to become interested. And not only would that help doctors become interested, but patients would say, hey, this must be important. My insurance company is paying for it. You know, whereas, you know, seldom do you find insurance companies paying for education. And if, if they do, it's a lot of rigmarole you have to go through to get what I would consider very ineffective education. Dr. Ornish, his program is now covered by Medicare. It is, yeah. It is. Uh, and so is the Pritikin program, I believe. But Dean, Dean started all that with... Uh, but he says that he went through a many, many years of hard work to get Medicare yeah. to approve it. 
we're not interested. Uh, it's not something that we, we've decided to get involved in. It's the, we don't have enough time left. <laughs> no, 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 no. What, what are you talking about? To get, a, to get us, oh. uh, to get our program approved by an insurance program company. Many years, yeah. We probably could. Years. I mean, we have scientific studies that support our program. So uh, I think it's just a matter of a small application and we'd be covered. But right now we don't, we don't do it. The program is so inexpensive. Yeah, it's well that I had Dr. Dexter Sherney on last week. He was a past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And he said the same I thing. Know, that he's a good man. Yeah. He said you have to change the payment structure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he he, he along with a, a few other people know the difference. As far as I remember, Dexter does not put this into much practice. So he, but he does know an awful lot. I've I've worked with him a bit. Yeah. So what's next on the agenda, either for you or for uh, when you come back? Well, I don't know. What would you like to talk? I, I, I owe you a lecture on autoimmune diseases and I owe you a lecture on high blood pressure and uh, whatever, I probably owe you a lecture on bowel problems, but it's pretty hard to top the bowel lecture I've already done. Yeah. Well, people love people, uh, the GI tract, especially now with all the interest in the microbiome, people really are interested in GI stuff. That just shows how, how basic we are to be interested in playing with poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go figure. I'd, I'd rather deal with the, the part that you put in. Thank you very much. It's, it's much, much more, much more palatable. That's for sure. Well, you guys are just so fun talking to. This is like, this is like an extended fireside chat. Yeah. Well, thank you, AJ. Well, no, you guys are always welcome. And it's just such an honor to host you. And, and as long as you'd like to come on, you will have a place on my dance card. That's for sure. Anybody impressing you guys lately? Is there anybody up and coming that you're saying, oh, thank goodness, you know, they're like any of the younger plant-based doctors or influencers that you have your eye on? Not that I can think of. No, and that's what we're worried about. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what yeah. about what about Craig? Like he doesn't want to step into the limelight. No, Craig, 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 well, he did this for a while and it was, it was kind of hard for him considering who he had for a dad. And uh, so he kept the enthusiasm up for, well, maybe 10 years, I actually went to Kaiser and uh, established the first dietary rules or they don't know how far they went as far as feeding a healthy diet to Kaiser patients. But, you know, and he gave lectures around town. Yeah, he gave lectures, sure. He did a nice job, but he, it wasn't his, you know, what he really wanted to do. Right now he works for OHSU. He's a full professor there. And, you know, we're talk, talking about things like what will he going to do in the next part of his life and things like maybe become a hospital administrator. You know, he's- yes, he, That's the kind of thing he's interested in. He's smart, he's personable, really easy to get along with and- And good looking, I might add. <laughs> You know, he's not, he's not dying. Good grief at his age. I was just getting started. Uh, that's amazing. Well, thank you guys so much. It's just so fun talking to you. And I look forward to whatever you decide to bring back. But I know all those topics are good. A lot of people do have autoimmune disease and it seems to be increasing. Well, we can talk about that. I'll give you a, kind of a short lecture. This lecture today was, um, there was an awful lot of material to cover. I know, because I always have to rewatch it. And then what we do afterwards is we, we edit out just the lecture part and put that up because some people maybe just want to see that. And that's, that's, that, and you're, we'll always be happy to give that to you. Yeah. All right. Well, well you, that's, that's the intention, uh, AJ. That's why I really appreciate you giving me the time to talk to your audience because it's much more real for me than to sit and just talk to a computer. And what I've done is I've put, put together a, a series of lectures of what I would tell you if I was your doctor. And someday I won't have that luxury, but we'll have it on film. This is what I want you to know about breast cancer, heart disease, weight. And usually I start out with a, uh, with a underlying crucial principle for you to understand so that you can follow, you can understand the whole rest of the story about, about medical care. Like for example, when I gave you the lecture on heart disease uh, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that uh, heart attacks are caused by these volatile plaques that rupture, not by the hard fibrous scars. 
And once you know that, you understand why heart surgery doesn't save lives. You know, you understand why you have to deal with it in the point of view of food. You know, in the lecture on diabetes, I explained to you about insulin receptors and insulin and, you know, how the food affects whether or not your body is able to, to deal with blood sugar and, you know, the, a normal adaption uh, to excess calories as you become a type two diabetic and insulin resistance. You know, once you understand that, that basic fundamental information, then it all makes sense to you. Same thing with breast cancer. Once I told you that it, it's a 10 year old disease by the time you find it. Aha, well, I see why mammography and early detection doesn't work. It's already been grown 10 years. And in this lecture today, I tried to share with you the basic issues of calorie density. The fat you eat is the fat you wear and carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive. Once you understand that, everything else makes sense. Anyway, that's how I'm trying to structure these lectures is to give you the, give you the aha, the really important part in the beginning and then let the rest kind of flow and for so that you understand why things are the way they are. Well, it's gonna let you go, but this question appeared twice. How do you feel about bone density tests? Uh, unreliable. Bone density tests are unreliable. Uh, they measure the mineral in the bone. And if you go to my hot topics under osteoporosis, you'll find the first article is a discussion about how by age 70, Almost 70% of women flunk their bone mineral density test. This is normal. You're supposed to have an extra two pounds of mineral during your reproductive years to grow the baby and to nurse the baby. After your reproductive years, in other words, you go through menopause, you don't need to carry this extra two pounds of mineral along. So you dump it out of your system and you naturally, normally, probably preferably, you end up with a lower bone mineral density test. And that's why that's why two thirds of women flunk the test when they get in their 70s. They either have um, osteoporosis or osteopenia. So no, I, I would not rely upon that test. And this, that test just leads you to a bunch of drugs when you should be getting a good diet, low protein diet, low acid diet, walking around, getting some sunshine. That's what you should be doing. Maybe, maybe you should Use a little hormone replacement therapy or a little antacid. That might be reasonable too. That's as far as I'll go as being a real doctor, because these osteoporosis drugs—they're—they're—they're they're, they're pretty darn useless. Yeah, you know, they're a little bit useful, but not much, and quite dangerous and costly. Anyway, get out of the business. Just just go home, eat, walk around, get a little sunshine, stay away from doctors. <laughs> yeah. I have sound like a broken record, don't I? You do. Yeah. So, yeah. I I believe eat, eat a damn potato. That's what I say. Right. Well, you know, just to, just to end this thing, it's just 100 years ago, Einstein told us that saving the planet will depend upon changing to a vegan diet. It's the same message that I'm carrying today with the website. And the reason that you ought to stop and listen, you ought to listen to what I have to say and they're trying to tell you is the truth don't change. The truth don't change. You know, if you have it right, if you have it correct, it's correct. So you find people out there changing their mind, being progressive, uh, something new. You know, I, I really question what's going on. Albert Einstein knew a hundred years ago that this planet was gonna be in big trouble. And uh, the only way we're gonna fix it with is with a vegetarian diet. And I'm trying to tell you that today. That's why I hope you'll, you'll get involved in the website and I hope the website develops into something that you'd you'll be, uh, you'll find very educational, very helpful. Well, and thank you for making almost everything you do available for free. Free. Yep, well, you guys have a great lunch. It sounds like you're having leftovers. We're having leftovers. Yep, and I'm having, I've, I've had the same thing. Dr. McDougall, you said years ago, you could have sweet potatoes and broccoli every day. So basically I do, and that's just still my favorite meal. So that's what I'll be having. That sounds good, DJ. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to talk to all these nice folks. Thanks, and we'll see you very soon. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about a half hour. I have another show today at 2 p.m. We're gonna be talking beans with Chili Smith. Take care.